Um, so I was trying to think of like an opening for this episode. I don't really have one, but I was like, well, you know, Caleb, I know you're from the the old country as well. We just had yes. um, <laughs> my friend, fr- my friend Jill from my old old country. Yes, uh, and then I have you from college old country. Old country, yeah. Um, and I was like, what what stories do I have of, of Caleb? Because we were both in the th- same yeah. department, the same major. And the, there's like one, just like one that steps right out of line. Just like me, ooh me, tell me. And I'm like, must I? <laughs> Do you remember? I had already graduated at this point, And I was dating a certain actress who was difficult. Mm. Um, and possibly, and I'm not a therapist, psychologist, uh-huh. anything. I don't have a degree in that. Same. But I would bet my, both of my feet. That she is a narcissist. Mm-hmm. I need you to stop betting your feet. I don't need. Just, <laughs> I don't need them. You need. You need your feet, it's, Jack. It's free money. <laughs> no. Uh, one man's feet are another man's treasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the story oh, goes. Dark, so the legend says. True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wait, I've got an email here from Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> I don't know if he would particularly enjoy my feet but we'll never know until we find he's out he's experimenting yeah. <laughs> yeah i can't wait for my feet to be in his last movie <laughs> uh, 12 angry men uh, <laughs> anyway on meth um <laughs> so this particular actress yes. she and i were dating i had already graduated yes and for whatever reason i do not know why but she had a she just hated you yeah, it, you know it didn't. It didn't matter. It wasn't like there was like a logic behind it. She just like picked a person and hated them. Yeah, like you could have like maybe like walked past her while you're on the phone and not paid attention to her for a second. And she Possibly. was just like fuck that fucking Caleb. Yeah. So like whatever. Like every time she would get home from class, she would like come to me and be like, "I fucking he like fucked me over again. Like I fucking hate this fucking fuck." Uh, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, fine. I'm so sad and broken as a human being." Like. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it was, it was like the worst yeah. year of my life, like for, for real. Yeah. Um, so it's just like, no, that's right, honey, you're right. Uh, it's just like, I need you to say something to him. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, like you and I have always gotten along. So I'm like, <gasps> oh, yeah. The universe is going. Um, so like I went and saw some show. I th- it might have even have been Black Friday, which is a musical that Joe We Garrett were both wrote. in together. Yeah. yeah and you guys were in. It was, it was a great show. I've yeah. watched it like four times. Um, so I was like. Caleb, 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 I need to talk to you in the classroom. I, like, took you in, like, closed the door, and I was like, and she's like, she's outside in the lobby. <laughs> and I'm like, Caleb, I have nothing, I have nothing against you at all. Not a, even a little bit. I don't agree with her, but, like, if I don't yell at you, I'm... <laughs> That's right. If I don't yell at you... I need you to pretend like I just chastised you really hard no, in this room. My life is going to be fucking miserable. So I'm going to scream. Yeah. I'm going to scream at you. And then when I want you to walk out of the room, like you're sad. Yeah, I was like, it was like a walk out with your tail between your legs yeah. moment. Yeah, I'm like so just like earmuffs. <laughs> yeah, I like had you, you put your hands on, I like screamed at you. If you just put some headphones on and listen to some music <laughs> like, real loud for a minute, I'm just gonna shout yeah. nonsense. Like, he, he was gone, and I'm like literally over there, like beat red, crying. I'm laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> just like. <laughs> I remember it. I don't know if it was Black Friday. I don't know. There were a couple was, times where I was show, like right. in fire and I was like, oh, bro, here we fucking go. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I and do remember that. Like, you walked out and she's like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny as hell. That's right. Oh, that's right. Uh, so uh, as somebody who has dated a narcissist, <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Just... It was a, it was a hell of a couple months, but like that was early on. Definitely a red, like yeah, a red flag. Just like an entire red building. I don't know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> an entire communist Russia. Yeah. Just <laughs> cue Soviet theme here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so that's to say we've been through a lot now. Yeah. After today, we've been through even we've more. Been, I would say this was more traumatizing. <laughs> no, honestly, the last thing was pretty funny. <laughs> Tom Hooper had no part in the last one. No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Um, so, for those who have not caught on yet, uh, we have been uh, drinking. I don't even. I, I might even have sorry said that. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> we might want to introduce the show. We'll get to oh, it, yeah. Joe. Yeah. If they hit the fucking button, they know. But <laughs> I mean, sure. I know. But... I know. We'll get to it. We'll see if I remember it. I'm just an idiot and I need it for my own edification. Oh, okay. <laughs> Joe, did you know 
we are recording a podcast. Fuck you. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We didn't just watch that movie for fun. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to Drazzle, the podcast that takes award-winning worst films and fixes them. I'm host Jack Culbertson. <laughs> Here alongside me, as always, is also host Joe Nealis. Hello. Uh, I forgot the rest of the script. That's the part I like, so I remembered it. But the second part is, uh, we do movies that have a bad thing happen to them. And we fix it. No, you you said it. You said the part. <laughs> oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, you absolutely did. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Razzies are something of a reverse Oscars. That, that part. Um, those are not good. They recognize the worst movies of the year. Um, Caleb, we, we have a, we both have useless theater degrees. Yeah. Do you do you still have <laughs> dreams about for like it being like show night and you? Didn't know you had lines to Always. memorize. I'm like, how? I haven't done theater in a long time. Same. And like, it, I still like have those moments. I, oddly enough, my dreams are getting much more elaborate. Yeah, and that like, right. I'm in like professional Broadway shows <laughs> with like big names. Like, I remember at one point I was given an award by Jessica Lang in one of my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm not sure for what. I think it actually was for like the Pittsburgh podcast. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> which has nothing to do with theater, I guess. <laughs> but the, just to give you an idea, those are the types of people that wind up being in the right, shows that right. I'm in in my dreams. I, I was in the. It was only like a couple of days ago. I had a dream that I was. I like showed it up. I showed up at IUP, and mm-hmm. they're like, "Are you ready to go on?" And I'm like, <laughs> "For what?" And they're like, "Midsummer, like Midsummer Night's Dream." And like I today. And they're like, yeah, like your costume's ready for you. Like, get in. So I'm like, all right. All right. So I was luckily I was one of the um, rude mechanicals. Yes, good. Yes, which, which I had been in the past. So like, I was Francis Flute, uh, which is probably why that. No, I was hoping came. you were gonna be bottom. Shit. No, 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 no. never, never good enough to be a bottom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I was like one of the other mechanicals, and I was basically I'm like, I don't know my lines, so I'm just going to act off of the other actors. So anytime one of the actors would say something, I just go, Yerp. <laughs> and uh, that was my dream. Um, so today we're going to do something a little different. We we have Caleb Figgles from the Making B Mar- Make, Making A Martini Making A Martini yeah. uh, podcast. Um, we uh, kind of combined our two styles, <laughs> meaning Caleb <laughs> made us a lot of drinks, yeah. and uh, we're going to fix the movie that you picked. Yeah, uh, which your your assignment was: Hey, what is the number one movie musical that you hate the most? Yeah, and you said. Les Mis. Les Miserables. 2012's Les Miserables. Les Miserables. The sound that everyone makes when they say it. Right. Uh, <laughs> Usually right after seeing it. So like, as soon as you got here, you started making us a drink, yeah. which uh, we are now going to uh, travel back into the past. Mm. Um, We're going to let Sober Us tell yes, you a little right, bit about this right. drink. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jack from the past, stone stone sober, to tell you why what happened, to explain to you what happened and why I am the way I am. Hi. Yeah, that's me, all right. You might be asking, <laughs> how did I get here? <laughs> and to, to explain that, we have Caleb. Hello. Making a martini. Yes. Okay. Hello. Thanks for having me. Of course. What what is, what is it that you've made? Well, this is called the La Liberté, to put a little French twist on it. Love the pronunciation. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, a Les Mis themed cocktail that I found online. And uh, folks, it is quite complicated. <laughs> it's a gin and tonic. Uh, <laughs> I was just telling him, I found a video online. And I was like, wow, that looks so great. I can't wait to do it. And then when I went to get the ingredients, I looked them up because I was just watching them make it in the right, video. Right. And then I was like, oh, this is a gin and tonic with cucumbers in it. (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) it's one and a half ounces of gin, uh, three cucumbers, some tonic water, and some slapped mint on top. You got you got to slap the mint. You got to slap the mint. You got to slap the mint. That's my favorite part about mint. It is. Let's try it. Mm. 
Oopsie. Ooh, that is nice. <laughs> That's oh. a gin and tonic. Oh. You know what, though? I did make sure it wasn't like terrible, so I tasted it in there. Oh, my oh yeah. God. Cucumbers starting to come through a little yeah. bit. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh my God. That's delicious. That's Thank great. You. Yes. Here's, here's for oh. those who want to try this at home. I recommend. I highly recommend. Don't eat any black licorice, <laughs> the day of. <laughs> Maybe even like the week I, of. I mean, I had. I had. To be fair, I had one piece of that black licorice yeah. as well, and it's not wrecking my palate quite that much. <laughs> but... I've been eating it all week, and there's like a hole. You just in are. my tongue. It's just like. <laughs> scorched earth <laughs> so the rest of my tongue is telling me that i'm drinking alcohol see my brain took that as you got your tongue pierced and have just been jamming black <laughs> licorice <laughs> into the hole it's it's like when people have chew but instead of the side of the mouth it's, it's the tongue yeah and no. it's black licorice yeah. i hate that i've opened this door <laughs> why did you do this no. Joe? It's awful. i hate my I brain you. so uh what what inspired you to create not the drink but the show uh, so back in 2020, the, I mean, just the greatest year, mm. <laughs> um, I realized about myself, there was a lot that I did not know about the world. And I figured, you know what? Those are the people that need to make podcasts, <laughs> uh, you know? So uh, that was the idea. It was supposed to be, I would pick topics that I knew nothing about, um, or little about, or just wanted to know more in general. And I would bring on a quote unquote knowledgeable guest. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, I mean, it's gotten, it's, it's, you know, gone off the tracks a few times, like my Grease, which is better, Grease 1 or Grease 2 episode. Right. Yeah, it was a great episode. <laughs> um, which is Grease 2. <laughs> the answer is Grease 2. Excellent. Uh, and what else? What was the other really bizarre one? Oh, uh, the Romy and Michelle episode. Yes. That one was, yeah. I guess my, the ones that go off, the, 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 the Spilling the Martini episodes are the ones where I get myself back into a corner. I'm like, oh shit, I don't have a topic or a guest. I gotta come up with something. <laughs> uh, what are some of the, recent topics you've covered uh most recently um i just did actually an episode uh, for valentine's day on the porn industry and i wound up talking with three uh pretty big porn stars in like the professional adult film industry that's wild uh, that's a good episode and it was it was really interesting like it was very um it wasn't what I expected, but it was a lot better than what mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Like, it was very open and honest. And, like, you'd think there'd be a lot more talk about, like, sex and, and you know, you know, <laughs> positions <laughs> and uh, cleaning material. But, um, no, it was uh, it was just, like, about life, about how it's their job. It, Accounting. Yeah. 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 Accounting. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot. Of, yeah. A basketball. No. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we did that. I've done a. Uh, uh, we did an episode on Scream because I, when the newest, mm -hmm. the latest Scream movie came out, oh, I, I just see that too. found out that it's <laughs> the original movie was loosely based on a true story. I did not know. that. Wait, really? Yeah, it's very, very loosely based. But Somebody dies. Kevin Williamson. That's was, it. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Williamson was watching, uh, watching something. He was house sitting and he was watching like um, 2020 or something, and mm -hmm. there was a, the Gainesville Ripper. Oh, okay. So he was watching yeah, that and he was like, wow. I am so vulnerable in my house all alone right now. Someone could call me and ask me what my favorite scary movie is. I, I, I'm assuming that's how it happened. It, that, that had to be the seed, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> it just simply had to be. What did you think of the um, the requel? <laughs> requel. <laughs> I, yeah, they call it that mm -hmm. in the movie. Wait, really? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's wild. The first time I saw it, because I have seen it twice, I had okay. to go back to make sure that what my opinion was was valid. And it wasn't. <laughs> uh, but the first, I went the day before it was actually released to like a oh, special nice. screening. Mm -hmm. So it was full of like hardcore yeah. screen fans. Oh, yeah. Who, and if, if you've seen the, the requel, you know that they, they go to do the exact, they go to like make the same, like almost, not, not, not jump scares, but the same mm -hmm. uh, takes, I guess, as the original movie. And then they don't, and they do something else. Yeah. So, like, everyone was like, oh, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. And then they didn't. So, like, the first half of me, people were like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, everyone was angry. They were like, this sucks. I hated it. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I hated it too. <laughs> uh, so, it was, it was, it was fine. I, I had a good time. The second time I went back, I was like, it's better than I thought the first time. Okay. Yeah. I, um, I enjoyed it, and of especially of the requels, it's the only one that I wasn't uh, severely disappointed in. Yeah, um, it's not going to be the first one, of course. No, I don't think anything can. Uh, but like of the 
scre- the the whole franchise is kind of bungled in my brain as far as like ranking system goes because it goes like <laughs> one and then two, four, and five are all tied for second place. I would agree with mm-hmm. that. And then three's at the bottom. Three's always <laughs> at the bottom. Did you happen to see, it's like in the very beginning of the requel, this isn't a spoiler, it, but in fact you should know this if you before you go see it. Uh, Courtney Cox is on TV as Gail talking about something, and it, it's like a cutaway thing, but mm-hmm. she's like, and that was the last time I'd had to get bangs, <laughs> which is a callback to the yeah. third, because everybody ripped her oh apart for those bangs. I, <laughs> I saw it with uh, Rob Hockenberry who's also a huge Scream fan, mm-hmm. and we lost it, mm-hmm. but the rest of the theater was not that No deep one else of, got it. So, like, the two idiots in front are just like, ha, ha, ha. And like, what the fuck's wrong with this? I know, because the rest of the scene is actually kind of, like, serious. Oh, right, right. So they're like, why, why are they laughing at this? <laughs> yeah, if you missed it, it was, uh, it, that was, that might have been one of my favorite parts, to be honest. That was, yeah. that was yeah. a gem. I'm a little surprised to hear that like so many diehard Scream fans hated it on their first viewing there because I feel like all, so much of the reception I was seeing was glowing yeah. whenever it first came out. People, uh, yeah, I feel like people that didn't really like follow. I, I mean, to be honest, I was never like a full diehard Scream fan. I saw Scary Movie before I saw Scream, uh-huh. just because of <laughs> honestly, that's, that's just honestly, how it happened. Same. I, that, and, that happened yeah. to me too. <laughs> so when I was watching Scream, I was like, oh, that was funny. That was really <laughs> smart. <laughs> That was good. Uh, but um, but then obviously I saw, you know, it, it became one of my favorite. It's my like, I watch it on Halloween every year. That's my always yep, my number same. one. Uh, and uh, the second time around, I definitely liked it a lot more. I want to see it one more time. Definitely for sure. I'm nice. glad I saw it in theaters. I think I can wait. I don't even think about it anymore. But yeah. So quick question before we go back to the present timeline. Yes. Uh, <laughs> what would you like to tell your drunker self? <laughs> Having su- having sat through Les Mis. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I wish you would have brought just slightly noise-canceling headphones. Because <laughs> you're going to get screamed at for about three hours. <laughs> um, Jack of the Future, uh, you really should have eaten more pizza before you started drinking. Uh, that was a mistake. On your part. I, and don't forget, you have to wake up early tomorrow. Like, you you really fucked up, my dude. Um, Joe? Uh, Joe from the future, please, please remember that you have TikToks sitting in your inbox that you need to show Jack and Caleb that are uh, just songs from Les Mis as though they were all sung by Russell Crowe for every part. <laughs> Oh, dear. I don't know that reference, but I'm sure I will. Oh, Here. you will. You're about to. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, brilliant. back to you, present time, Jack. <laughs> Got mint leaf. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Wasn't that wasn't that fun? Refreshing. Refreshing t- t- four hours we ago. Sound, we sound so different. God, I miss those days. <laughs> we sound like we still had something to live for. <laughs> <laughs> the, those those hours before we had experienced uh, Tom Hooper's Limous. So we have had several gin tonics. Yeah. Gin tonics. Yeah. Um, More or less. Yeah. A, 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 an, a, uh, an elevated gin to yeah, talk, let's with say. some fresh yes. cukes. Yeah, the cukes mm. were really good. Cukes they were, were great. They're quite um, good. I just, like, just finished pulling them out of my, <laughs> out of my last one. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a simple drink, but like those cukes do add. They add, yeah. Um, it's a nice little treat at the end. Yeah, a little yeah. crunch, a little bite. Yeah, I love, um, I love a good snack. <laughs> so, uh, so what we're gonna do today? We're going to do what we normally do, just way worse than we usually do it. Um, we're going to uh, summarize Les Mis. We're gonna talk about like what worked, what didn't work. We're going to um, fix it, and then uh, once we're done with that in ten minutes, we're going to um, rant about just the, the, whatever, whatever f- f- we think is funny at that exact moment. Um, but before we do any of that, Joe's going to tell us <laughs> some things about podcasts, specifically ours, and uh, where you can find it. Yeah, you can find us on uh, pretty much any platform where you listen to podcasts. So uh, please do that. Uh, please look us up. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your loved ones. Uh, please have them subscribe and follow the show. 
Uh, please rate and review the show in any place you can so that we get further up in search algorithms and people have an easier time of discovering us. Yes, those things. Yeah. 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 No one I, says it I'm better than Joe. Steadily getting drunker. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. I've, I've maintained a very steady um, buzz. Mm-hmm. Which like I'm crossing over that point now. <clears throat> yeah, I I did like uh, a quick shot of Maker's Mark, thinking that would push me over, <laughs> and instead my tummy was like, "Sir, <laughs> <laughs> that has no place <laughs> being inside of you. How dare you? How dare you?" <laughs> um, so I just got an upset tummy and not any. Oh. Uh, so let's go ahead and summarize Les Mis. Um, but before we do, I want to read you the tagline, the actual tagline for Les Mis. Fight. Dream. Hope. Love. You know, I saw that at the top of the poster and I thought that was just like marketing bullshit. That's the actual <laughs> tagline of the film? I'm going to say yes. Uh <laughs> So one one of the reasons, besides you picked this movie, yeah. one of the reasons we thought it was appropriate is um, Tom Hooper, the director, also directed a movie that we have come to dread. Uh, a to... movie that haunts us to this day. The the movie that kind of ruined me. <laughs> 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 it, it was a one two hit. It was it was Cats Part One and Two, and then Saving Christmas Parts One and Two. Kind of just like broke me as a human. It being. was that particular set of two parters in a yeah. row just like destroyed your psyche. Yeah, uh, but it started with Tom Hooper's. But it cats. started with Tom Hooper's Cats, uh, and then I think he did that right after Les Mis, I believe. Um, I think it was the next thing he did after Les Mis, but it was seven years in between. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. He had some time to think about it and still fuck <laughs> yeah. it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> think is a strong word. Um, Joe, would you summarize the movie Les Mis for us? <laughs> Ooh, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> I, I, will, I like your abbreviated version before you go into a lengthier version. Oh, so the abbreviated mm-hmm. version I gave, uh, if you're just following uh, Jean Valjean's perspective here, uh, is uh, I killed your mom, saved your boyfriend, and found some shit. Les Mis. Les Mis. Les Mis. <laughs> Uh, the longer version is <laughs> uh, a man steals some bread, <laughs> bastard, is arrested and thrown into a uh, a jail camp where you have to pull boats. I guess yeah. is give is eventually given parole and is then haunted by his decision to steal bread to save a child's life for the rest of his life. <laughs> He steals a priest's candelabra. St- steals a bunch of silver from a priest, and the priest is real cool about it and is not a narc, so he does not. Right. Yeah, so he yeah. doesn't. He doesn't Coolest rat him out. Movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely the best character Some, in the yeah. entire Some goddamn you can just movie. Really go and get a drink with. Yeah, right, you know? <laughs> I, I stand this priest, as yeah. the kids say. <laughs> it. <laughs> Christ. He then decides to turn his life around, and some time later. Uh, there's a lot of 18, time jumps. Yeah, in eighteen this movie. years is our first time. Jump. Eighteen years yeah. is, the, I think, the first time jump, and he he becomes, uh, he becomes the owner of a factory or something that employs, something. uh, that employs yeah. uh, Anne Hathaway's character, who also like does some sex work on the side because she has a kid somewhere that like is that the dad why... ran out on them and is she that had... why they hate on her? That's why they hate on her. Yeah. It's yeah. like yeah, oh. all these all these women that work with her in this factory slut shame her yeah. and the creepy foreman that was trying to hit on her the entire time just lets her go because yeah. Hugh Jackman is too busy being haunted by the ghost of his bread stealing past to like give a <laughs> right. damn. Oh, see right. I didn't get that out of the anime. <laughs> <laughs> or or the movie <laughs> or the movie really yeah, I, it's I mean there. It's that yeah they really don't address it in I the movie I was just like these all. these other or, ladies yeah. are just really mean yeah well that that is <laughs> I, I, that I, is I, I only subtext. I only caught like half of the words yeah the subtext is like these are really a bunch of mean ladies but yeah. like if you pay attention to the words it is largely them slut shaming her and ah. like being pissed off that she's like the foreman favorite so they just want to like get her out of there so they can, you know, steal her glory. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then she goes and ends up in an even worse situation where she's selling her hair and her teeth and so on and so forth and just wishes she was dead. And then after trying to defend herself in an altercation, she ends up almost being arrested by the same Jag that, that, uh, that has tried to ruin Hugh Jackman's character's life. Uh, Played by Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe's Javert. Javert. Jaybert, <laughs> I think is the word you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and Hugh Jackman, uh, Jean Valjean, going by some other fucking name. I don't. Who cares? Two four six zero one. Two four six zero one, which he, was his prison number. That's yes, why. he's. 
<laughs> no, but he's going by a different name in this town, I think. But he I has forget a couple I, separate names. Yeah. Oh, what yeah, it but, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not important. He comes to her aid and rescues her from being arrested, so she can die in a hospital. Which and, he, he's ultimately at fault for. Yeah, he could yeah. have stopped the, the factory workers from like shitting on her so hard, or the foreman from firing her and throwing her out yeah. in the street. Yeah, he was there. Where did he? In the, in the instance where she, between her getting fired, where did he go? He, he went and helped the guy. Well, uh, he, well, he, he pissed off. He fucked off because uh, Javert was up in his office uh, suddenly, and he was like, uh, "Oh no, yeah. I need to tend to this because I might be in trouble." Right, Crover yeah, showed up. Yeah, and Javert doesn't even like. N- know who he is. He yeah. doesn't recognize him at all because like all, a bunch of time has passed. Some <laughs> fucking different. putz get stuck underneath a wagon. Yeah. Oh, something yeah. Like this. Yes, he yes. like hulks out and lifts it up. <laughs> Russell, of course, stands by and watches. Right. <laughs> doesn't yeah, doesn't he help. Just, like, nice. let's, let's Wolverine <laughs> lift up the heavy thing yeah. and then that's, yeah. yeah. It... <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so so Anne Hathaway's character dies twenty minutes into the movie and gives probably the best performance right. in the entire damn thing. Excellent performance, yeah. won an Oscar for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and out of his guilt for having done this, uh, uh, Jean Valjean goes and finds his daughter uh, under the care of innkeepers. And I use the term innkeepers loosely because it's two. Uh, it's, it's, we got a couple of Sweeney Todd's. Two Sweeney yeah. Todd style crooks played by uh, Helena Bottom Carter, surprising no one, and uh, and. Sasha Baron Cohen, surprising no one. Right. Yeah. Uh, they were very good. They're a lot of fun in the movie, mm-hmm. and their like their parts are just delightful. Uh, but they are, yeah, yeah, they're largely there just kind of, to kind of illustrate the troublesome upbringing that this kid has had since you know leaving her 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 sex worker mom. And, and here's yeah. where I thought intermission belonged, but Caleb actually informed <laughs> no. me it was not for another hour. <laughs> it was not for um, another hour. <laughs> yeah. Joe, are you familiar with the game Popcorn from high school? I am. Um. I think you should popcorn. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll go for a little bit. I'll pop. Yeah, I will, sure, I will sure, sure. popcorn though. Yeah, um, yeah. Finish this, this so, little stretch out. <laughs> <laughs> so Hugh Jackman goes and tries to save the kid from, uh, you know, from these two these two charlatans. Uh, claims he's going to pay them like fifteen hundred uh, francs, francs dollars whatever uh monies monies, monies uh <laughs> monies. to take the kid and he so he basically swindles them out of the kid mm-hmm. uh then he produces a doll that she looked like she wanted out of nowhere like there was no yeah. scene of him getting that he's just carrying yes. a doll in his jacket this entire time for no discernible reason honestly it was an ugly doll mm-hmm. it was an ugly doll was honestly what the hell france uh so <laughs> so then he takes the kid they're gonna go live this life he suddenly discovers what love really means because suddenly taking care of a child uh, and sings an original song that won a bunch of awards, but honestly was... Does not fit. But <laughs> in, in, in a carriage, so great singing. In a carriage. Yeah. It, was, it was just completely still in a carriage. Just, uh, yeah, it doesn't fit the tone of anything else that happens but to the be entire fair, show. It was a shit year for movies. <laughs> it was a shit year for movies. I'll give you that. Except for Killing Them Softly, which you should go watch. It's yeah, you should watch. Why didn't we watch Killing Them Softly? Highly underrated. Uh, Brad Pitt is in it. Uh, the bunch of other actors in it. Really great dialogue. Should have watched um, Killing Them Softly. Should have watched uh, that. Anyway. Don't watch it with your parents. Javert stops the <laughs> caravan of characters. Carriages and in his search for Jean Valjean, ends up chasing them down on horseback while he and the little girl run away and then, like, just jump off a building or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I started yeah. losing track of like the thread a little bit there, but they eventually do escape. Yeah, um, they, uh, that little girl outran a horse. Yeah, they, proud of her. <laughs> she sure did. And uh, now I will popcorn to Caleb. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, so then Jean Valjean and little, uh, little Cosette escape. Uh, oh yeah, the kid had a name. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, it's Cosette, <laughs> the girl from the poster. The girl, from, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, the girl from the poster. And then uh, we get to see a little internal monologue from Russell Crowe. We'll call it a monologue because it was a lot of it was spoken, even though it was a song. <laughs> he made some choices, and, he, and you know what? I bet he stands by them. <laughs> I don't think he would regret. He would voice regret. No, no. But he's, you know, Batman sulks on the top of a building and um, <laughs> almost walks off the edge, but doesn't. And uh, just regretting, regretting letting him go, get, having him get away, but also regretting still chasing him down after 18, 19 years, something, like that, yeah. something around there. It's very dedicated to that yeah. specific job. <laughs> yeah. So then we have another time jump. Uh, we go Eight years, nine years, nine years, nine yeah, years, nine, nine years, years later. One. Yeah, um, everyone's a little older. No one's any wiser. Uh, 
but we're introduced to another little kid character named Gavroche, uh, who's a <laughs> little Cockney boy living in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> one, of many, one of many, one of many British Cockney people. Children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we know his name because he goes out of his way to introduce himself to just some noble in a carriage. <laughs> yes. Is that yeah. what the song was? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the point of his song. It's like, hey, I'm here. Listen to me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we see the the slums of Paris and the the wealth divide, and I'm assuming that's what they were going for. <laughs> they should uh, try. Yeah, oh, they, yeah, they did try. Um, and we meet some other characters. We meet uh, Marius, played by Eddie Rum. Red Rum. Red Rum. Eddie, Eddie Red, Red Rum. Eddie Red Rum. Uh, and uh, Albus Dumbledore. No, hold on. <laughs> uh, Eddie Redmayne. Thank you. Yes, yes. I was really blanking on his name. I was like, oh, shit. Uh, you know. We meet him. We meet Aaron Tevet, who is a Broadway actor whose character name I don't actually know. But was, like, way more enjoyable and entertaining yeah. than yeah. Eddie yeah. Redbone. Yeah, Eddie Redbone. <laughs> um, and they are sort of uh, leaders of the, the revolution of the poor people. Um, and they're saying that, you know, thank God that this, you know, higher up has our backs and he's looking out for us. And then what happens? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we see uh, Jean Valjean and uh, Cosette ha- has grown up, played by Amanda Seyfried. Seyfried? Yes. Uh, who? I said Siegfried. Bl- who, like bless her heart, <laughs> tries. <laughs> <She's laughs> <so, okay. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's she's all grown up now, and she happens to spot Eddie Redrum across a crowded <laughs> across street. <laughs> and they... The I fuck. I fuck. They mm, instantly yep. know that they're in love and that it's meant to be... But Hugh Jackman's like, oh man, gotta get her away from this guy, which she does. He takes her home. Yeah, Uh, and then we find out that oh, Eponine, we did forget about Eponine. Yeah, the 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 actual daughter of the innkeeper, right? Played by Samantha Barks. Barks. She was great. Yeah, she was great. I want to say Banks, but I'm pretty sure it's Barks. It is Barks. Okay, great. You know, we see that she's also grown up, and she is in love with Eddie Redrum, uh, (laughs) but has not told him yet. And I hope she doesn't learn to regret that. <laughs> it just seems like maybe, you know, something she should do. Uh, but she sees that Eddie Redrum's in love with Amanda Seyfried um, by simply looking at her. And uh, then well, then where do we go? Pop- popcorn me. Popcorn, popcorn Jack. All right. I, don't, I actually don't know what happens next. I just want to <laughs> jump. I just want to get this to fuck over with. Um, so, uh, bis- biscotti, biscotti, little boy, I get shot and killed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which makes the rowdy boys real upset. Yeah. Because they're like, we're, we're, hey, we're, we got all your furniture in a pile. We're going to throw a revolution. And the French soldiers are like, hey, over there, are you a god? And they're like, no, we're a French revolution. <laughs> and they're like, just what we wanted to hear. So they shoot, they shoot him, they shoot at him. And then, uh, the, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm getting it. I got it. Yeah, you're doing great. You're doing great. No, I mean, I'm I, actually, that's, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Sam- <laughs> Samantha, Samantha Barks. Yeah. Um, dresses like a boy so yeah. she can go fight in a war. Yeah. Uh, honestly, she's the only one that's like worth her salt. Uh, she gets shot, of course, because yeah. she literally stops a bullet from hitting Eddie Redrum <laughs> by taking the gun and pointing it into her chest because she couldn't have pointed it any Anywhere other. else. Not She's, up or anything. Uh, not up or left or right, but directly into her heart. Yeah. You didn't even have to do that, Sam. Sammy yeah, Marks. Come on, Sam. Um, <laughs> but she she was cool. I liked her. and She's dead. Um <laughs> Then she's like, oh, hey, just so you know, I'm going to die in about 20 minutes, Ed, Eddie Rub Rum. So I got this note that uh, uh, 20 minutes, Amanda, we'll see you do each other later. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Amanda S- Siegfried and Roy um, gave, well, like, left for you, but, like, I didn't give it to you because, like, I'm kind of a bitch, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I didn't like that you friend zoned me, Eddie I Rub didn't Rum. Like, she, he did friend zone her <laughs> yeah. so hard. Like, Maybe she did deserve like, it. Like, not even, like, I mean, she might have deserved it, and, like, friend zone's kind of a, a troubling word, but... Yeah, it's a stupid, unreal oh, thing, death, but, you never see, but you never see a woman get friend zone. It, so. It's true, yeah. The thing that part bothered me, he's like, hey, I'll, would you, I know you're in love with me, but would you help me find this chick that I, like, I fucked that one time? And she's like, fine. fine. 
<laughs> and she does, and then like they're singing and having this moment where they like touch fingers like E.T. through a fence, and she's over there like singing like Why won't you ever love me? I, I just didn't listen to the lyrics. I didn't give a shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she's dead, and then like I actually forget how Hugh Jackman's uh, Jean Valjean um, gets a hold of the note, but he do, and then he's like. <laughs> Oh, oh, right. Biscotti gets it to him. Yeah, the, yeah, boy. the fucking uh, Gavroche, the kid right. does. Uh, Broche, yeah, he yeah. gets it. <laughs> <laughs> this is before he died. Yeah, he didn't come back to. No, he didn't he come was, back to life. Yeah. yeah, we've we've non-lineared this the same way we did our alcoholism. So. <laughs> <laughs> And Hugh Jackman's like, ah, you know what? I was kind of being a dick about that whole like letting my daughter have a person that like she can relate to and love because she has hormones. Yeah. I'm going to go, fuck, that's a war. He might die because war does that. Mm -hmm. So he goes and he's like, oh, hey, Russell Crowe, who got captured and is like tied up. You can go free for yeah. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. He lets um, Javert go, th go free uh, and acts like he shot him. So that, yeah. the, so that the, uh, the, you know, clearly skilled and knowledgeable and capable mm -hmm. rebels, they are the worst uh, fucking rebels. They're really fucking bad at their jobs. Terrible. Oh my God. First of all, you all captured 12 of them. You captured, like, a leader of the military, and we're just like, what should we do with him? Ah, well, let the people decide. Sir, you are the people. You are the people. <laughs> you are the people. <laughs> you are the people. And the answer is shoot him. <laughs> uh, and they're like, oh, we'll let Hugh Jackman, who's a stranger who came dressed in, like, soldier uh, attire, we'll let him decide. I'm like, you guys suck. You deserve to lose. And they do. <laughs> and they do. Um, uh, so we'll jump right ahead to that part where they lose. Yeah, um, that's next. They do. Yeah, and then Hugh Jackman's like, "I'll save Eddie Redrum for my daughter." Yeah, Eddie Red Eddie Redmayne Redrum gets shot and is bleeding out, and then Hugh Jackman decides to, sh to save him by dragging his wounded body mm -hmm. into a sewer. But it's fine because like it's just coffee grounds. <laughs> It's like so it's just like straight up coffee grounds with like too much liquid, uh, where they run into like Sasha Baron Cohen and who's like I'm stealing that ring, and then he tries to get drowned by you know, he gets drowned. Sasha Baron Cohen almost gets drowned in some poop, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but it's fine. Like they escape, and then Hugh Jackman gets caught by Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe's like I'm gonna do it, and Hugh Jackman's like, but like uh, do I do it, you won't I do what you bitch. Want. I'm covered in shit. What? <laughs> And I'm like, Hugh Jackman, we can't even tell, like, who the actor is in this scene. Maybe just give yourself, like, your face a wipe so we know that you're <laughs> Hugh Jackman. Um, no, nah, it's fine. You're dedicated. I get it. I get it. Um, you're doing this for the love of the musical, not for the love of <laughs> the paycheck. And, you know, he, Russell Crowe's like, I'll shoot you. And he's like, fuck you, bitch. You're not doing that. And then Russell Crowe has a song where he, like, walks back and forth over a railing his, and he's like his, a his second Batman-esque scene yeah, where he's Batman walking on a song. high ledge um, um, and he's like I don't know why I let him go he killed me by letting me free and then he jumps into some water and breaks his legs and then dies yeah Oh. It breaks his, he breaks his everything. He breaks his, his everything. It's pretty most rough. Of him. It just, like for a river, he, it was quite shallow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he like, he aimed at like the exact point of this like water falling brook in the yeah. river that like, like had to have had a man-made like lip in it. Like, and he just lands the like. the most painful version. He lands like yeah. stomach first into this lip. <laughs> just yeah. like you, that, that was unnecessarily right. painful. Right. Javert, you didn't why need you to do doing? that. But good for the audience. Javert, you know? why? <laughs> um. So then we like we have a wedding with uh, Amanda Siegfried and Eddie oh, Redrum. Oh yeah! By the way, Eddie Redrum's character is fucking loaded right. and has a rich ass family and just kind of just kind of forgets like, about his revolutionary uh, brethren who all died. <laughs> died. Yeah, yeah. And then he's like, "Oh, but wait! I found out that like Hugh Jackman saved me in the shit water." Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to stop my wedding and go save him right now. Yeah. Uh, and then they get there and they sing and then he dies cause he's sleepy. Um, <laughs> he dies because he's tired. Yeah. Cause he's tired. <laughs> Jackman's been through a lot. He's like, <laughs> to be right. fair, he and did start the movie by pulling a giant boat. He is, yeah. he is very tired. It wasn't as bad as when Anne Hathaway died cause she was tired. Yeah. <laughs> like she didn't, she didn't done as much. I mean, she had a pretty rough like week. She but, had uh, a hard time. I, yeah. She had a very hard time, but, but she could have had a nap and been done. She didn't have to like die about yeah. it. They could have like, like medicined you know, her. They could have medicined, medicined her. her. Yeah. Like a little face mask. It's, but it's cool. You know, like, a relax. <laughs> you pamper bitch. Like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Hugh Jackman died no. and went to sing with the ghost revolution. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the, the end. 
Les Mis. <laughs> Les Mis. <laughs> and that was six hours. <laughs> There's so many fucking stupid subplots in this goddamn oh my piece God. of shit movie. Yeah, it almost rivals uh, Spice World for the like, number of side plots. <laughs> so many. Uh, <laughs> so here's the part of the show where we talk about things that made the show the way it is. Um, money. Uh, Wait, do we, co- do we cover the scores? We're going to do that now. Okay. Um, hey, Caleb. Yeah. Uh, what would you th- say the general audience score is? No, no. The, wh- the critic score. The general critic score. Jesus Christ. Score. <laughs> I will never get it right on I know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say the critic score is for, honestly, on this one, it really doesn't matter. That's fair. Um, Les Mis. Is it a percentage? Yes. Uh, like out of, out of 100. 100. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with 35. Not how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, oh. Uh, 25. <laughs> <laughs> uh, general critic, uh, uh, 60. Do, do you know? Uh, I forget, mm-hmm. but I think it might have been higher, actually. 88. What? Oh, God, I didn't realize it was that high. Fuck. It's really high. Uh, how about the audience score? Another percentage? Mm-hmm. Um, 52. 89. Mm. What? <laughs> yeah. These scores oh are ridiculously God. high. Like, when you were like, hey, this is the movie the mu- movie musical I hate the most, I'm like, oh, great, we're going to be able to trash this movie. And then I like went and looked at the scores, went to look at Henry Razzie's, nothing. Like, people love this fucking movie. You know, though, I, it would kind of make sense because it's the movie based on the musical. So the people that were going to see this, you went if you were a fan of the musical. And I think if people who are fans of the musical, which I am not a part of that group right. either, <laughs> went to see it, they were like, wow, art. But to, I, 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 like, I don't necessarily see like non-musical people really flocking to the theater to see this. No, I mean, I certainly didn't. Yeah. Um, so do you think that holds true for Cats as well? Like fans of Cats went to see Cats and they were disappointed by Cats? I do happen to know people that thoroughly enjoyed Cats. I'm no longer friends with them, but I mean. <laughs> That's how I recognize these people were toxic and cut them out of my yeah. life. Yeah, it actually was very helpful. <laughs> it's a super helpful tool. Uh, but but there, there, are, there are just kind of like those like music theater, you know, diehard people that are like, so great to see this work come to life. I guess and I, I got 20 minutes into Cats and I, I did turn it off. So I have not actually – actually, the most I know about cats is from listening to you guys. So. Hell yeah. <laughs> it, it's really the way to experience cats. You're better off, frankly. Yeah. I, it is – I'm still astounded thinking back on it, like how visually overwhelming it is, but so also much. how boring it is. Yeah. It's – Right? Wow. Just, uh, and no buttholes. And um, no buttholes. What's no butthole. the point? Well, no. We, so, well, you know, we, offered, we offered an option for it. Yeah. In our fix, we offered the butthole toggle option. Yeah. Uh, I don't want that for this movie. N- not for this movie. No. no for Les Mis? Uh, I think buttholes would help. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> I think if everyone showed their butthole right at the know. beginning, you could be I like, all right. See, I don't think I want to see Russell Crowe's butthole. You wouldn't see it for all the hair. Oh. IMDb. <laughs> what? Christ. <laughs> I want to say he was originally considered to be Wolverine. Uh, we'll have to look that up later. <laughs> I, I want to say that this movie was made specifically because there was a rivalry between Russell Crowe and Hugh Jackman because they both wanted to be Wolverine. Well, and they Hugh really Jackman should have had Ryan Russell Reynolds Crowe's... in here somewhere to just like court both of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> just sixteen uh, percent of what I just said was true. Um, IMDb. <laughs> yes. Uh, out of ten, what do you think Les Mis got? <clears throat> Six. Joe. Uh, this one I don't know. Um, I'm gonna guess. Oh God! I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna guess a seven point one. Close, uh, seven point six. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Still too damn Dang. high. So like, people really liked this movie. This it's... was not a bad movie as far as Razzies go. Yeah. No, um, no, and uh, just for frame of reference, like, so this movie was nominated for a ton of Oscars, for yeah. a ton of other awards. It it didn't win Best Picture at the Oscars. I think that was the year Ar- Argo won. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this did win, like, Movie of the Year from a bunch of other, like, critics organizations and stuff like that. 
it wasn't nominated for a single Razzie. And the reason why is because, like, the shit that was nominated for Razzies was so what, what so year bad. was that for Razzies? It, it, well, it, it, this all this all this stuff came out in 2012. So mm-hmm. this is early 2013. That all these award shows were happening. Uh, so for the Razzies, your worst picture nominees were Twilight, oh. Breaking Dawn Part Two, which won. That'll do it. Battleship, <laughs> which is still one of the worst drinking experiences I've ever had in my life. <laughs> that drinking game is designed to murder somebody. I swear to God. The Oogie Loves in the Big Balloon Adventure, which don't look at the poster for that movie. You'll be cursed for life. (laughs) That's my boy. The Adam Sandler, uh, Andy Samberg vehicle. I I blanked on his name. I blanked on Andy Samberg's name for a second. You didn't want him to be associated with the movie. I didn't. But here we are. Uh, And A Thousand Words, which I really don't know anything about. Um... Aside from the fact that Eddie Murphy's in it. That's all I know. Hmm. And the only reason I know that is because he was nominated for Worst Actor. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the other nominations as you go down, you have like One for the Money, you have Ghost Rider, The Spirit of Vengeance, (laughs) you have uh, Alex Cross, you have Medea's Witness Protection, and you know, the Razzie's, you know, fascination with Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. You have the remake of Red Dawn. (laughs) You have, oh my gosh, that's right. You have Atlas Shrugged Part 2. <laughs> you have a lot of garbage in here that got nominated because it wasn't really all that great a year for movies in a lot of ways. It's really, like, Argo was a fine enough movie. It's, it's interesting it. historically more than it is as a movie. Yeah, it is interesting historically. That is one of the reasons why it's, like, still on my radar of, like, oh, I should go back and watch yeah. that. But And it's not a bad movie. Like, the performances are great. It's just not what I would typically say is, like, oh, this was the best movie of the year. Right. Yeah. And like a lot of the stuff that is nominated here, like I understand it being nominated. Like right. everything in the Twilight Saga getting nominated for a Razzie makes perfect sense. Uh, that's my boy makes perfect sense. Battleship, yes. The 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 Oogie Loves or whatever, like that's a kids movie, yeah. despite it having like a weirdly star studded cast. Yeah, it is um, a little strange that that got nominated for worst picture, but. But yeah, no. There's a lot of there's a lot of trash that year that would like deserved recognition as such. It's understandable that Les Mis got kind of overlooked in the midst of all of that. But the level of critical acclaim that it got feels kind of bizarre too. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of the performances, I'm not gonna say a lot. I I really enjoyed Anne Hathaway, but as we've yeah. pointed out, she's only in it for about twenty, 20 minutes, twenty maybe thirty something minutes. Something like that. Yeah. 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 And Hugh Jackman was great. I, my my major problem with the movie, aside from Kurt Russell's performance, Russell Crowe, Kurt uh, Russell Crowe, Kurt, Kurt Russell, Russell Crowe. Crow. I'm sorry, Kurt Russell. I love you so much. I just I want to like erase Russell Crowe because I was thinking about this story in the movie. Um, <laughs> there are certain actors that I'm like, oh, you are good only because I've been told you're good. Yeah. Um, and there are two actors in this movie that are that for me. Oh. Russell Crowe, who's like, he's not an awful actor, but he's not... He's not a good singer. He's an awful singer. No. But I've never seen him like, oh, his performance was excellent. I've watched him in a bunch of movies, too. Like, I've watched Beautiful Mind. I've watched Gladiator. And I'm like, your performance is... It's fine. It doesn't detract from the movie. Yeah. But he's also not, like, the standout performance in all of those movies. Like, Beautiful Mind in particular, I feel like... um, Connolly. Jennifer Connelly? Jen- I mean, Jennifer mm-hmm. Connelly mm-hmm. was was excellent. But I'm also thinking um, Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's but, incredible. Yeah. But also Paul Bettany was like excellent in that mm-hmm. movie. And he's playing a hallucination. Right. Like, <laughs> it was a really good hallucination. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but and I'll probably catch shit for this. But Idris Alba is another actor where I'm like, I've never seen you in a movie where I, I, I am like, oh, you are – always going to be an incredible Oscar level actor. I've only ever seen you as like, you're fine. Yeah. Or Wolf, I'm, which was Cats. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to hold Cats against him. Cats is the one instance that I can think of where I've seen him and been like, oh, Idris, come on. Right. Every other time I've watched him, like, it might not be an, like, it may not be an Oscar level performance, mm-hmm. but I've always been like, nice. I've enjoyed watching you. Yeah. Uh, and this one is also Eddie Redrum. Eddie Redmayne. I, I had a feeling you were going to say that. Where yeah. I'm like, I've never hated you in a performance, but I've never watched a performance by you where I, I'm always blown away. Like you are an A-list 
Oscar level actor, and I don't know why. Mm. He, I think he he like he worked his way into some prestige because of some of the roles he managed to la- mm-hmm. land after this. Like this yeah. one, like, like this won an Oscar, and then he got Theory of Everything. He got the mm-hmm. Danish Girl. He got. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's another one in there that was like really noteworthy. He's a he's a Dumbledore. Fantastic Beast. Fantastic yeah. Beast. He's yeah, Dumbledore. he's Newt Scamander <laughs> in in uh, in the Fantastic Beast franchise. Yeah. Um, I mean, and he, I've given, I've only seen the first of those movies, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed him in that role. I think he was really well suited for that too. role. Yeah. But like overall, those movies are like, it, yeah, I, like, I wasn't looking for. I knew what I was going getting when I went into it. Exactly. Like, right. Just like yeah. any Harry Potter movie, I'm like, right. right. And I don't expect like Oscar level performances out of no, movies like that. No. Um, but I also, I just, I haven't seen an Oscar level performance out of him in general. And yet he, like, he, I think he has one, doesn't he? He does. D- yeah. Danish he girl? did. He yeah. did win. Yeah. Yeah, was, he won seen, for so the Danish I'm just girl. I assume it was good. And I think he was nominated for theory of everything. If I'm not I mistaken. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not shitting on him or Idris Alba or, um, I know what you mean though. It's like Russell Crowe, but I'm also like, you don't, like I'm not drawn to a movie because I see your name in it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Like I, do, I don't dislike whenever I see him, but he doesn't. He's yet to like really wow me. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think he has it in him. He could for sure. Yeah. But like when he popped up on screen, literally half, like a little over halfway through the movie, yeah. I was like, "Huh, oh. cool, all right." I had forgotten he was even in this, and I'd seen the movie before. <laughs> <laughs> um. So before we go to critiquing the film. Um, I'd like to touch on the stage version yes. of the show because I have not seen it live, unfortunately, and I don't think you, Joe, have seen no, it No, I've either. also not seen it live. Caleb, you're the only of us who have. Yeah. So how is this typically <laughs> I that... present? I know you haven't seen like a, a Broadway performance. You've right. seen like more local versions. Yeah. So it's very, uh, very much focused on the vocals and the solo numbers. That is what all the stage shows that I've seen seem to sort of fall back on. And that um, usually whenever it's done, it's like a, it's an event. Like, you know, if you see it at a community theater, it's like the best of the the best of the best, mm-hmm. quote unquote. Sure, right. Uh, you know, come out for it. People <laughs> come back to town. It, you know, it's like one of those things where like people do it over and over and over. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it makes money. People just get off to lame is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just, I guess, you know, what, you know, some people's preference on music theater. Um, but typically, like, what you see is you get, like, facades of sets. You get um, random furni- random furniture pushed on, like, a bed mm-hmm. or a table or, you know, things like that. More is sparse it, in terms yeah, of Yeah, yeah. You're over. not having, like, full-blown... So you know, it's more like a studio theater type thing where you're like, yeah, you have the, the furniture that's necessary yeah. for the scene, but that's about it. Right. And it's a lot of because a lot so much of the show is plant and sing. Like when, mm-hmm. you know, you've got minimal choreography, you don't have, you know, they I, I think to be perfectly honest, if there was elaborate sets and like all this stuff, I think it would just make it more confusing because you'd be mm-hmm. looking at other stuff and you're like, oh, fuck, I've really got to pay attention <laughs> to the storyline because there's already four new people on stage and I don't know who they belong to or why they're here. <laughs> yep. Um, so the, the, there is no dialogue. If I, I don't I don't believe so. I'm pretty sure if, if there is, it's one or two lines, maybe a couple words. Which that style is referred to as sung through. Is yeah, that correct? yeah. Okay. It's it, it. I I would classify it as an uh, as an operetta. I mean, it's because it's, okay. it's all sung through, which I, I think is a big reason why the movie just like even more so doesn't do it for me because they mm-hmm. add these elements of like almost like plot and backstory that you don't get in the show. Like, yeah, you, you don't, you don't get to see the, the, the Gandalf trek to Mordor in the very beginning <laughs> and, and you don't get the giant battle scenes. I mean, there are battle scenes, but it's like 30 seconds and it's over. Sure, yeah. and you're like, wow. Like imagine like that, those last two battle scenes mm-hmm. in the movie were like 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Like that is like compressed shrunken down. down. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Cuz like this is all essentially leading up to the June Rebellion, which right. was 2 days in June of 1832, a, a factual yes. actual rebellion. Yeah, an actual right. thing that happened in Paris and like that takes up almost the entirety of the end of the film with the exception of like the wedding stuff and like the the uh Jean Valjean dying and whatnot mm-hmm. for what is supposed to be essentially the second act. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. 
it's based on this rebellion, but they give you all these fictional characters and how they weave into the story of this rebellion, which is completely fictional. Or the, the rebellion is real, but the the, the characters okay. and the love story, the the plots, how plots of like, is. yeah, like obsession, revenge, like all that stuff is just a bunch of bullshit to get yeah. you to the June Rebellion and be like, oh, I care. <laughs> <laughs> Except you don't. <laughs> right. I, like, I don't know if that. And we'll, we'll get into critique. yeah, and that's and I would say that for the show as well. Like that's that's the kind of it, it's that same kind of idea. You've got all these characters, people going in and out, and you get to this you know major event where people start dying, and you're like, why? Okay, <laughs> what happened? Because I was going to ask you, like the movie is about two hours and fifty. It's almost three hours. It's like two yeah. hours and fifty minutes. Yeah, um, is the show longer? Ish. I think the show's you know? about two and a half. Okay. So. Because cause for me, like, a lot of the characters had a foundation that they could have been interesting or could have been, like, I could have cared about them, but they didn't have the time to build them. Yes. And I was like, oh, maybe the show is, like, four hours long and they, they no. flesh out these characters. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that there are elements of that in the show. Like, for instance, um, Eponine and uh, Marius, Samantha Barks, Eddie Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Eddie Rem- Rem- their yes. their relationship, I think, is fleshed out a lot more in the show, and that movie really doesn't do that justice. And I no. have a feeling that it's because like we needed more screen time for Russell Crowe to ride a horse, right? right. You know, um, <laughs> so you don't you don't you don't get that. There is more of Amanda Seyfried's character too, so you actually like feel for her when her father dies. Whereas like in the movie, you're like, where the fuck have you been? Right. She disappeared for the entire rebellion. Yeah. Like she wasn't there. Yeah. She he, was like, gone for a large percentage of the second act. Yeah. There. Where did she, like he, uh, Hugh Jackman was there. Yeah. <laughs> so she couldn't have been that far away. She just was, I don't know, smoke break off. <laughs> <laughs> smoke break. Yeah. She's back in crafty. Uh, you'd also mention while you're we watching it, that there was, there was a, a portion during that death scene at the end where Cosette and the ghost of her mother have a have like a, a, yeah. a moment and that's not that it's not in the film yeah it's a beautiful moment and the the harmonies are like it, it it's like one of the only moments of the show that I love and every time I've seen it it's given me like chills because it's it's very full circle for their characters mm-hmm. but the movie cuts out parts of their care I mean not really and Anne Hathaway's part uh the fan the fantine part is pretty much in whole like we see her yeah. and actually i honestly you get more in the movie of, of her really? than oh, you do okay. of her in the actual show like you don't see this sort of fall from grace that she has from working at the whatever kind factory? Of mill or factory yeah factory, yeah, yeah factory to you know um you, you get sort of like the prostitutes like taking her under their wing and being like you know the lovely lady song and you get that, and you get like gentlemen, like you know, bobbing and weaving through a crowd. Sure, you know, very. And, and there were certain moments in the presentation where it felt very much like a set, mm-hmm. where I, it almost, almost not quite as obviously, but almost like watching the film version of Chicago, mm-hmm. uh, mm, yeah. where you have the different sex workers in the windows, yeah. kind of doing their their song and dance, um, as uh, Anne Hathaway's character is being. Um, Destroyed by these, I don't know if they were supposed society, to be like, like society or, and pimps yeah. and whatever. Yeah, having your teeth s- stolen or whatever. Right. Um, which I, I don't know. It feels weird to say, but like I really but you like. Lo- yeah, I liked it. it was yeah. it was a nice look at that that character that you don't get in the show, and that might be the one thing the movie does better. Okay. Is, and is and her part, as we said, mm-hmm. she received an Oscar for that yeah. performance. She, yeah, that was Anne Hathaway's first uh, first Oscar, oh, really? I believe, okay. uh, for yeah, best supporting actress, yep. and deserved. Absolutely yeah. deserved. She crushed it. Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing the the show live. I think I would actually probably enjoy it more, uh, if for no other reason than you would have actors that are trained vocally. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, which was an issue that we'll get to. Yeah, I think I would still have issues with the characters not being yeah as developed, but I think we'll get to. Yeah. Any other big differences between the film and the stage show? Um, no, the only other thing that I remembered was that they moved one of the songs up. Um, there's a song that would typically be in Act Two mm-hmm. that they moved before, like the end of the Act One song. Okay, sure. The Act One song is that "One Day More," where it's like five. Every character has yes. their own vocal yeah. line. Yeah, which is um, like a great song. Yeah, but but yeah. like the, the visual presentation of it was so scattered and and like it was rapidly you couldn't it focus was, on it. Yeah. yeah, it was disorienting. Yeah, um, but yeah, they moved that song beforehand, uh, which I mean. 
I don't I couldn't tell you if it was better or worse. I yeah. I, I think uh it was in the show it's nice to give her something to do other than die in act two but in the movie <laughs> yeah, right, i guess it yeah. doesn't really matter and it happened in a moment it's a song of love to eddie redbrum yeah so <laughs> it in the, and everything that was happening in the movie at that point i guess it makes sense but right i know they moved it that's really the only other big okay. i don't think they cut anything really major either i don't think it's been a hot minute if, if i gave you a phone mm-hmm. and john travolta was on the other end right now what yeah. would you tell him John Travolta? Mm-hmm. John Travolta. Like, um, about Les Mis or just, just in general? general? Oh. Like, I was um, like, oh, hey, the phone's for you. And I hand it, I'm like, oh, it's, it's John. Oh, I would. It's me, John Travolta. I, I would, <laughs> uh, I Caleb, would ask him you? what, <laughs> what, uh, what filming the movie Lucky Numbers was like. It was great. I had a fun time. <laughs> um, and, and where the, a lot of those ideas came from. Please tell David uh, Miskiewicz I'm still good. <laughs> And I would also s- blame him for uh, being a major ruining plot of the Hairspray movie. Okay. <laughs> That's about it. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Um, you you hear you hear you heard it here first, folks. Uh, Hairspray, go watch it. No, not that one. <laughs> the old one, the John Waters version. There mm-hmm. you go. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, very fun. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> This stupid fucking Joe. <laughs> Joe, you're better than this. Why are you here? <laughs> what? Have you met me? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, run ad. <laughs> uh, welcome back to Drazzled. Uh, we are going to talk about what worked, what didn't work about Oof. 2012's <laughs> Les Miserables. Which does stand for The Miserable Ones. Which I would put us in that group. Yeah, that's <laughs> we, fair. We are, in fact, it's a meta title. Yeah. <laughs> we are the miserable ones. Yeah. Um, so what worked for you about the story? What worked? For the, the story. The story. The story. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've already touched on it. The Anne Hathaway storyline mm-hmm. yes. definitely works. And quite honestly, I the the ongoing story of Jean Valjean and Javert had there not been so much else, I think that storyline could have been fun to watch. I think it's it gets easy to forget about it at times, but like yeah, the through line of that I think does that, work. That's the most consistent one. Yeah, it's the one mm-hmm. you get from the beginning, and it that's the I guess it would have to be the carrying story. The, the through line. <laughs> Yikes! Yeah. And Samantha Barks, her the the Eponine character, the on my own girl. Yeah, she works. Uh, her her storyline. It was pretty true to what the musical was, and mm-hmm. I think it, it came through in the movie. I think Tom Hooper fucked up and like truncated her part too much, and like we get mm-hmm. through a little bit of that too quickly, and it's not developed well enough. But I do think that like the core idea of it does yeah. work, and her performance is fantastic. Her mm-hmm. voice is spectacular. She, uh, she uh, her her emotion is believable. Mm-hmm. That's what I was about to say. Is even though we don't see a lot of it on screen. Her performance implies that she's been in love with that character for a long time. Yeah, yeah. that unrequited love comes across mm-hmm. perfectly. Yeah, I, I would have loved to have seen more of that. Yeah, yeah. Like that's... we'd covered in our previous episode, uh, Heaven's Gate, and like as long and as obnoxious as this movie is, I think it actually would have helped to have had more time to sit with these characters, mm-hmm. especially on the back end with Amanda Sidfried's. Eddie Redrum and I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. Oh, not Samantha Barker, but the character's name. Eponine. What, uh, Eponine? Eponine. Yeah. yeah. I, to see that love triangle develop more than just like, f- yeah. uh, man, you, uh, you, like, I saw you cross the crowd and you were totally bangable. That's not enough for me to. <laughs> I saw you cross the crowd in the middle of France and I jizzed in <laughs> my pants. <laughs> I mean, if they had done that song, (laughs) (laughs) just Andy Samberg walks past, (laughs) makes a horrible face, and you just know. (laughs) Honestly, he can't be that expensive that like you can't just pay for him for a cameo. I'm pretty sure if you pitch the right gag to him, he'd do it for free. Like Andy, Andy, yeah, love your work. Um, (laughs) Great, great album. Um, (laughs) I love the Lonely Island. Here's a here's a pitch. Could you walk by in the background? Of this musical, you may have heard of it, maybe not. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and jizz in your pants. <laughs> you don't have no, 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 no. You don't actually have to do it. You don't no, you know to, the like, faces jizz. you made. But, like the faces just, you made. Yeah. yeah. 
If you can just come past and do one of those, mm-hmm. like be, like just in frame and like we'll do a split focus, mm-hmm. like where you're like thirty <laughs> feet behind Eddie Red Rum right. and just you're just coming. And then we cut there. to behind. You, you will we'll also have you behind Amanda Siegfried in the same cut. You yeah, just no, in. you're going to be in both shots. Yeah, because <laughs> clearly you're into both of them. Yeah, <laughs> I bet my. I've already lost my feet, so I bet my kneecaps. Okay. That he would do it. You need your legs. Nah. <laughs> 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 uh, God damn it, Joe. What, what worked for you for story? Oh fuck. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just literally took a sip of Baker's Mark because you were asking. It's me garbage. That. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I like it. Actually. Why isn't there scotch in my cup? I mean, that's a, the real question. I like the boat scene. To be honest, the opening really worked for me. The opening was quite the spectacle. Mm-hmm. Um, I really was like, I, "Fuck, I, Russell Crowe!" Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that did a good job of establishing "fuck Russell, fuck Russell Crowe." Like that, like that, that did a really good job of pointing out like what a what an asshole Javert is. Yeah. Especially just like from the moment that you hear Jean Valjean say that he stole a loaf of bread. Yeah, and. Javert's still like, if I fucking find you, if you do, you do anything out of right, line, like, right. I'm going to be on you, like, white on rice. Yeah. Like, it, like, like from that moment, it's like, man, fuck 12. Just, like, a, a cab yeah. right here. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, so I think that worked. The other thing that really worked for me was the candlesticks. Yeah. The recurring the recurring visual motif of the candlesticks. So we mentioned that uh, that uh, Jean Valjean steals all that silver from that priest, and he's caught. And but when he's brought back to the to the priest, the priest is like, "Yeah, I absolutely gave him all of that." But my dear friend, you left so early, you forgot to take the best of it. And he comes back with those two silver candlesticks, and is yeah. like, "You must use this for good." And that's when he has like his epiphany and his turn. And you know, it's, it's like the the inciting incident for him to become a much better person, mm-hmm. even though he stole fucking bread to save a child's life. He was a fine person. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have any feelings about that at all. But they keep popping back up. Yeah. They pop up like three or four times throughout the course of the film. And it's always whenever he's having a crisis of faith. Mm-hmm. It's like he goes back and he sits by them, and they're like they're like the last time they pop up, it's him and Amanda Seyfried, and they're talking about uh, Eddie Redrum. I'm just assuming. I'm just like I've accepted that that's his name now. Yeah. Well, it is. It, <laughs> <laughs> just talking about like this 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 boy mm-hmm. and this uh, like, and what's all what all's happening and he's just like his sits down next to them and like they're just unobtrusively in frame yeah. while he's front and center and it's yeah. just like it's it's fascinating to me that, like Tom Hooper of all people had the foresight to like center uh, to frame things that way mm-hmm. and allow that motif to continue throughout the entire film like that was smart yeah. that was good filmmaking where is that in so much else yeah, for the in rest this of it. and in cats were they at the just, end when he died Spoiler alert. Ooh. Really good question. You know Spoiler what? Alert. I forgot I to look. I, 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 at that point, everyone, you're just sort of like, I know what's coming. Be. You're like, oh, yeah. It's yeah. the end. It's the just, end. We're almost just, through this. Just go to sleep and die, sir. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's a big problem there because, like, I should have been looking for that. Or if they're yeah. not there, they should be there. They should be there. That, oh. Damn it. Now I have to rewatch that scene. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to rewatch the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to tweet every time you see a candelabra. It doesn't matter if Hugh Jackman's in the <laughs> scene or not. Yeah. I'd be our guest. It, it's hard. <laughs> like I was watching, I was looking through Tom Hooper's filmography and it's wild to see the IMDb scores that he has because they're all above six, right? Which is pretty good for a director. Stupid. It's like six, seven. Uh, I think King, King's Speech is eight. And then you get the cats and it's 2.7. <laughs> <laughs> like wow, was that a dip? Yeah, uh, one of these things is not like right. the other. <laughs> like I don't necessarily. It's hard for me to say. I don't think he's a bad director because I've seen Cats, and I also know how he was to the um, the visual, the effects, visual team. effects team behind s- screen. I, I'd like to read more about the actual production of this to see, like, mm-hmm. how does that compare? Because this is these are the only two musicals he's done, to my knowledge, right? I believe so. I think so. Like, so, like, uh, did he treat the visual effects team the same way for this as he did for Cats? Did he treat the crew that way? Did he t- did he treat the cast that way at all? I want to like, say that uh, there was definitely some visual effects on this film. Oh, absolutely. But I don't think they were as quote unquote 
groundbreaking. Like what the visual effects team had to do for cats was way harder. Yeah. And not done before. God, yeah. The, well, uh, this the visual effects for this were far more grounded. Yeah, it's like yeah. make this building here that wasn't here before. Yeah. Right. And some but, of it's a little exaggerated. Like uh-huh. you see a lot of buildings that are like leaning in and yeah. like right. at exaggerated angles, like not quite to the like Tim Burton levels. Right. But right. like they're you you notice yeah. them. Outside of the opening, there really isn't anything all too crazy. With like the ship. Yes. The, right. The, the you know, ship you know, is yeah. probably the biggest one. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Like as soon as that scene opened, I'm like, ah, god damn it. It's another like computer, like almost entirely computer generated film. And thankfully it's not. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Why couldn't you do that for cats? <laughs> As far as story goes for me, overall, I th- I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to read the book, but I feel like if I had read the book, if I read do re- read the book, if I'm ever like trapped in a cabin in the middle of the woods, that's the only book that they have, and I have to maybe. read it. <laughs> maybe I might just I don't know count. I would check to see trees. if there's toilet paper right. first. <laughs> right. If there is, I'll crack it open. I'll read the toilet paper. <laughs> This is shorter. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mega roll. <laughs> Two ply. Uh, <laughs> I feel like given the room to develop characters and story and environment, I would enjoy the story more. And there are aspects of it in this movie slash show that like I can see the big picture and I like the big picture. The presentation of it. I did not enjoy it, but we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. I like the rich first poor. I like the rev- revolution aspect. I, I mm-hmm. do like, yeah, I like the class angle of it. I like the, I mean, I, li- I like that they, they didn't try to do like a grandiose, um, like French revolution mm-hmm. kind of thing. Because I don't think Tom Hooper would handle that responsibly. <laughs> uh, no. But the fact that the fact that he went with the June Rebellion, it's mm-hmm. something that is much more contained. It's something that's much more... I mean, I shouldn't say that he went with, like Victor right, Hugo right, yeah, went yeah, with, yeah. Yeah. but has carried through through every adaptation of this. Right. Uh, I'm glad he didn't try to shift it to something that it wasn't and right. do something he has to, you know, bite off more than he could possibly chew. No, arguably, maybe, maybe he did a little bit, but right. But I, I like that it is, it's contained. It is, you know, it, 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 it's sad. It's unfortunate. Yeah. But I think like this is maybe more of a Les Mis problem that is a Tom Hooper's Les Mis problem mm-hmm. uh, that. It, the the revolutionary nature of it maybe doesn't carry through quite as much, yeah. But the fact that those themes are there and presented so front and center, and you know, I, I, I think I think there's something to be said for that. That is, yeah. All, all of the themes are very much. You don't you don't have to search for it. No, <laughs> they very much lay it out for you. They're like, this is what you're about to see. Yeah, here you go. It's it, it's it not trying to be subtle in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. The first. Uh, it's hard to break it up into acts because I don't actually know where the act break, breaks are or where they should. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Tom Hooper knows what the uh, word act means, man. Um, yeah, but I haven't seen any of his like non-musical work. But Have you seen King's Speech? I haven't. No, I want to, I though, because I love Colin Firth. Um, but... I want to say that's the same year. <laughs> it's the same year I was dating the actress we were speaking ah, about yeah, earlier. Yes. Uh, it was a very memorable year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think Black Swan came out that year and I was like, why uh, is this oh, not winning? I fucking <laughs> love Right. Black she was Swan. like, I really like this movie. I'm like, I, I bet, bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> I really identify with this character. Yeah. Just <laughs> watching it caressing the <laughs> Right, right. Oh, no. <laughs> she's like, I don't really think she's the bad guy. I'm like, well. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> oh, wait, did she actually say that? I can't remember, but it, if she didn't, she surprised. said worse. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but but I remember watching King's Speech. I'm like, the, I didn't enjoy this as much as Black Swan. Yeah. But also, I didn't. I wouldn't expect Black Swan to win Best Picture. Uh, whereas King's Speech was a safer movie to pick. It, it, okay. but it, it was good. Like it wasn't a. It surprises me that like the first two movies I watched by Tom Hooper was King's Speech followed by Cats. <laughs> <laughs> That's a jump. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Les Mis feels way closer to King's Speech than it does. Cast. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think you, you can like you can see a through line from like an actual film narrative to a movie musical to I just did way too much acid. <laughs> Uh, and how much of that was him picking a terrible subject matter versus like him fucking up a terrible subject matter is it's yeah. difficult to say. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so let's jump ahead to actors. Mm-hmm. Or no, no, no. I'm sorry. What didn't work for story? Mm. I think condensing all of the plot lines 
into how long was it? <laughs> Two hours and fifteen minutes. Two hours and fifteen minutes. Fifty. Fifty. Okay. Five I was gonna say that, feel, that, feel, that didn't feel right. Right. right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Condensing all of it down into one movie. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that. Was That's not like I, 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 the mm. one of the one of the bathroom breaks I took because we <laughs> took many because <laughs> we had to. We're human. We, there were a couple, yeah. Uh, but I was thinking, I was like, man, what if like it almost like feels like it wants to be it it, it feels like it wants to be longer, mm-hmm. which thank God it's not. But if it were to be, I would appreciate having maybe even parts, like a part one and a part two. Interesting. Not entirely sure if I'd watch them. Kind of like <laughs> Angels in America, where you yeah, have part yeah. one. Yeah, or even two. even like if you think about it in the terms of like a like a, a trilogy, almost like mm-hmm. a Lord of the Rings type, oh, Hobbit God. type, See, like breaking but, it up. But it, uh, can it can that story sustain multiple sections? I don't know. Hmm. That. Oh, but I God. think we get those fleshed out characters. I, like 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 movie one is all Anne Hathaway, Hugh mm-hmm. Jackman, Javert. And baby, and baby girl, baby girl cassette. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if if we got if, a l- very little uh, baby c- cassette, very small. I mean, very that's how bit. it is in the show too. It's mm-hmm. it's like a little kid. But actors. in the anime, in the, you get a t- <laughs> ton of baby cassette. That's the other thing we haven't really talked about. You mentioned mm-hmm. you, you mentioned mm-hmm. there is an anime adaptation there, of this that you've said is. is beloved. I I have only gotten to watch the first episode because it's a little harder to find in, in the the U.S. The it, and it's it's a longer series too. It's like sixty episodes. It's not like a shorter sixty. Wow. Yeah, but none of what I watched in the single episode was in the movie uh, oh. because it shows in Hathaway's character. She leaves. I think she leaves Paris uh, in search of um, work, and she's like she has to make the hard decision of whether or not to leave her daughter Cassette with mm. the. Um, the innkeepers, the innkeepers. yeah, oh, and so then that would be so cool. Yeah, no, like I, I, it, it's not the typical anime that I would watch, but like I didn't not enjoy it. Yeah. Uh. So, and, and we'll get to this. I think with the with the fix, but yeah. I think going longer, as weird as it says, as it feels, given that we watched a three hour fucking movie and right. hated it, um, might be the answer. Yeah. But I think. I agree 100%. There's too much information for the runtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Watch the anime. <laughs> yeah. It has a gorgeous opening song. And, uh, oh, I don't doubt that for yeah. a second. Yeah. It's anime. I'm very, yeah, I'm very mm-hmm. curious about that. Yeah, I'm going to have to try to track that down. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, like The idea of this being longer like kind of hurts, mm-hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, it does feel like the thing that makes the most sense because so much of it is truncated. So much, yeah. so much yeah. of it is shortened and suffers for it I yeah think. I, I would like to be given the time to make up my own mind about caring about these people yes. yeah whereas in the movie i don't get the time and therefore I therefore don't, i don't i don't care <laughs> correct especially the back half of the movie the first yeah. half very, I'm like yeah, i kind of much. like i do care about hugh jackman's character a little bit yeah uh, i care about Anne hathaway's character that section feels fleshed out yeah it. i mean and that is also again how it is in in the musical it's very much so, like, we watched Heaven's Gate, and there's an intermission two hours into that film, and there's another, like, hour and 40 minutes that follows that. Mm-hmm. It's a long-ass fucking movie, but, like, it does the characters the service that it needs, mm-hmm. arguably. This, I feel like... It does, it, it does the song service, it but does not the, the characters. It does the song service, but not the characters. I think that's a fair thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. It... And I think just given the way songs and musicals work, if you do better service to the characters, you're doing better service to the song. I agree. I agree. 100%. Uh, w- let's Man, move I'm, on. I'm drunk and I can figure this out. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to actors mm-hmm. who we, we've kind of already covered this, so we can breeze past it a little bit. But who who are the actors that work for you? Anne Hathaway. Easily, yeah. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, Helena Bonham Carter. Absolutely. Who, by the way, I don't think they actually mentioned their names once, but they are the Tenardiers. Okay. I don't Yeah, I don't think they did mention <laughs> no, their they names don't. at all. But I don't think they also mentioned them in the musical either. You just oh, see yeah? them in the program. Okay. So you just know that that's who they are. Sure, sure. Uh, um, Eponine, Samantha Barks. Yeah, Eponine mm. was excellent. Uh, I really I, enjoyed Eddie Redrum's friend. friend? 
Aaron Tveit. The other, yes. yeah, yeah, the yeah the the other revolutionaries. Mm-hmm. I think that, that weren't Eddie Redmayne yeah. or the Child. Yeah. yeah, I think worked really like, well. Maybe that's the point of it. But like Eddie Redmayne didn't feel like he was all that invested in the revolution. No, I mean, no. And, and given that's part of his character's struggle for mm-hmm. a little bit, but we don't. But, it, outside of his grandfather being like, you bring disgrace on your right, family, right? Yeah, yeah, on your house. Other than that, you get nothing. Yeah, yeah. until uh, you don't get any. Like it's it's mentioned there, and then it's abandoned mm-hmm. until he wakes up from after having been dragged through the sewer, French press. Yeah, after being dragged French, through a French press. Yeah, um, he was French press. He yeah. will <laughs> got him. Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Like it's not brought up again until he wakes up out of that, and mm-hmm. his grandfather's like looking down on him, and it's it just like, "Oh my boy, you're you're you're, you're here." Yeah. And then he, then they're just they're just fine, yeah, for the rest of the film through his wedding yeah. through all that. Oh, that was his dad. That was his, that was his that, gran- was, that was his grandpa again. Yeah. Yeah. Extra weird when I said they should kiss. Then <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was. So, <laughs> yeah. So for, I for think that's what they misleaded. For reference, Eddie Redmayne's character wakes up out of his like gunshot wound, uh, Paris sepsis. sewer sepsis, <laughs> to see his grandfather through blurry vision, and Jack goes, "Now kiss." <laughs> It would have been cute. I just didn't know they were related. I think it would have too. <laughs> oh, good Should lord! Nice mustache. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mustache. Shut up. <laughs> I think Lady Miss needed to be gayer. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That's really oh, why Javier is so I sad. Mean, well, <laughs> he just needs to get laid. He just needs to get laid. Well, we by could. Jack well, we could go back to the. <laughs> It's just sexual frustration. Yeah, that's what. It, that's why. Yeah, come on. It's not about it's, the bread. It's two what, former, pri- former prisoner and former imprisoner. So, just yeah. fuck it out. Yeah, Wolverine and Wolverine. Have- <laughs> well, Ryan Reynolds sexual. jerks off in the corner. <laughs> done done. I found my TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Where were we? <laughs> um, so we were talking about actors. Oh, right. Who, uh, we're works. talking about actors who do and don't work. Though you did just bring something up that we could go back story wise. Uh, you mentioned while we were watching it that the entire uh, Eddie Redbrum uh, Cosette uh, Eponine storyline uh-huh. that love triangle could be completely resolved with polyamory. Yeah, and, no. yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, French are very progressive. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the British French. The, Br- the British French, yes. <laughs> yeah. Then there's something that doesn't work for me, actor-wise or story-wise. Fucking everyone except for Sasha Baron Cohen selectively has fucking British <laughs> yes. and or Cockney <laughs> accents. accents. In like, France. Thick Cockney accents, yeah, too. Like, yeah. hard. And again, that's apparently like a Les Mis problem. Yeah, and, it is. Every show I've ever seen, has it's always been British. <laughs> and it's, like, and why? It's a set I have in no Paris. idea. I have no idea. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's maybe the original show was in, like maybe well, it was in the West End first, and then, it, I don't know. I think but they looked like, it up, and I think it was presented in France initially. Okay, so I, I, I did look that up earlier. Uh, so in, in 1980... There, the first musical adaptation of Les Mis was in French in okay. France. Okay, that makes uh, and then, sense. And then I in buy that. and then in 1985, that's when it hit Britain. That's when a that's when okay. an English okay. musical was first done for Les Mis. All right. So yeah, so 1985 it opens October 8th at by the Royal Shakespeare Company at the Barbican Theater, okay. or Barbican Center. So that is, I believe that is in the West End. If you know where the is located, uh, write in at Durazzled <laughs> Podcast at DurazzledPodcast.edu. What the fuck is that? I don't know where an email is. It's DurazzledPodcast at gmail.com. That's what I said. Oh. Wait, did you say <laughs> edu? Edu? <laughs> it's an education. And fucking Durazzled <laughs> University! <laughs> hey. Who knows where things could go? <laughs> it's been a weird year, guys. <laughs> we run the university now. Jesus Christ. Uh, fantastic. But that would that that would track though. Like if it started over there, and I think that that's brilliant that it started over in Britain, hmm. and then it came over here, and people were like, "Oh, it's a British musical." 
It's and not. It's a very <laughs> stupid American thing to, yeah, to happen. Yeah. All Americans are simps for. <laughs> right. <laughs> Plani law. Uh, yeah, but no, I believe, I, I do believe that that's probably how it happened that they were probably. like, oh, we all need to be British now. But yeah, every show I've ever seen, they've been British. Whereas, and I'm not saying that I need them to have French accents. I'm saying just let them speak however it is that they speak. And I want it, Australian we'll go unaddressed. on Australian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that would be Hugh Jackman on Russell Crowe. Good day, mate. My name is Jean Valjean. <laughs> <laughs> Just lost our entire Australian audience. Uh, goodbye, that one listener. Uh, <laughs> By Ewan. <laughs> what? Uh, where is Anne Hathaway from? <laughs> we also just lost she's, Caleb. she's American. <laughs> is she? Oh, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> all right. Any other actors who didn't work before we move? Or were oh, we on story? Uh, Russell Crowe. Russell, Russell Crowe did not work okay, at all. No, not at all. Russell Crowe. Amanda Seyfried didn't really work for me, but I don't know if it's because <sighs> it's. Her her voice just isn't. It's the only. It stands out so much as not fitting in with everyone else. Yeah, I agree. It and it's her vibrato. It's just it's crazy. She's so absurdly high pitched the entire time, and the rapid vibrato. Like mm-hmm. I swear, if like if my bones were made of crystal, I'd be hospitalized right now. Yeah, all the dogs for like a mile radius are freaking out. I want her to put out a solo album where she's playing like the harp. And like indie covers, and I would love it. Yeah, yeah, I can but see that. For Les Mis, for Les Mis, her voice doesn't work for me. No, no. Um, I think she uh, she is like a, a legitimate good actress. Like yeah. I've, I've oh, never enjoyed her. Not yeah. enjoyed her. And they like I like I think some of her stuff was 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 cut. And that on, mm-hmm. to be honest, I don't think that role's very well written. It, it, it's it seems to be a no. plot point for other people. Yeah, as absolutely. opposed to being her own independent. In the anime. You get a lot more, <laughs> but no, I, I she's absolutely both in her younger iteration and her older version. Um, she's a plot point, like she's, yeah, a, yeah. she's a plot device. I mean, yeah. So yeah, she didn't have a whole lot to do other than be like, oh, she's the reason Hugh Jackman has a purpose and yeah. Eddie Redrum has a boner, and like <laughs> that's it. And she sings like Snow White. Yeah, she does sing like Snow White. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which in other cases might not be that bad a right, thing, but no. it does not fit for this. <laughs> yeah, especially it, it, when everyone else is like is not singing not like, like Snow White. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about production? What worked for you for production? Oh, hmm. I'm gonna go first because I absolutely love the camera work in this film. Like as much as the film in general is me, <laughs> I, <laughs> like I I kind of hate how much I enjoyed the camera work in it. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of close ups. There was a, there was a lot of like uh, framing the actor in the like lower third, especially during these like bigger dramatic moments. Especially in the first half of the film, you have a lot of um, in Hathaway, Hugh Jackman, in mm-hmm. these very dramatic moments. Not only just like framed very tightly, but also not uh, not cut. It's just it's just a long take, One continuous shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of that throughout it. Like I know the the part where she's getting her hair cut off. Yes, uh, right. Yeah. Was a, I mean, obviously that they really did cut her hair off because I think like at the actual since she did win the Oscar, and yeah. they, she was pretty much you know yeah not even at like pixie cut length at that point because it was like so <laughs> recently. Uh, so yeah, they 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 like fully did cut her hair off and it, they were like we can only do this once, so please get right, it right. right. Please, yeah, you know, like, uh, more. which I have to wait like makes a me actually year and like a her half. performance even more. Uh, <laughs> right. Oddly enough, <laughs> sidebar. Please, but it's the whiskey. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> we did uh, Sweeney Todd, whoever the fuck knows when. And um, I was <laughs> Tobias, the child. At this was this was 2013. It was 2013. Okay. So like I'm still, <laughs> I was 24. I was 24 at this sure. time, and about roughly the same size I am now, a little bit smaller. So we were like, how do we justify me being the child? And it was like, <laughs> we got to make him just a little bit, you know, not quite all there. <laughs> <laughs> And at one point, somebody mentioned, was like, what if, what if Toby had mange, which is a condition. <laughs> what if Toby had mange? <laughs> what the fuck? And so, I just see, like, one hand going up in the back of the auditorium, like, what if 
told him he had mange. And uh, I like the way you think, kid. The, the, the director loved the idea. And they were like, would you be okay with that? And I was like, because I was like, I'm not trying to wear a wig. It's right, like, it, right. we did it in the Indiana movie theater oh, where there is no oh, air conditioning. I'm like, I'm no. not wearing a wig. And all this like... <laughs> All, so I was like, we're going to have to cut my hair. And I was like, we'll do it on one condition. <laughs> and that is if I can, we can release a promo video of me lip syncing to I Dreamed a Dream, the Anne Hathaway song, <laughs> in a bathtub while people cut my hair. <laughs> and that video is currently on YouTube. I will oh, watch that. That's incredible. Uh, we're definitely going to release that to promo this yeah, episode. They, oh, uh, halfway through, man. they turn the shower on. <laughs> so I'm just saying they're just like... <laughs> <laughs> With giant chunks of hair. <laughs> anyway, oh my god! That was um, the best production uh, thing that I liked about Les Mis. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes, the camera work on that one take is visually very stunning. Uh, I think you were saying yeah. earlier that people initially had. A yeah, problem with those close-ups. They were like, "Why is everything so close? Like Anne Hathaway's snotting over everything." But I like it. It really works for me. Like, uh, like seeing that the vulnerability of mm-hmm. her, Hugh Jackman, even later on, Samantha Barks when she has mm-hmm. her song and she's sort of in the rain, crumbling like under a bridge or whatever, wherever she was. <laughs> and even even Eddie Redrum, uh, his song. <laughs> I, I think we were all at that point like because it, it was so close to the end. It's the right, empty chairs, right, empty right. table song. We were talking about something. Like, it was a it newfound was, it was glory much, song at that point. There yeah, reminded me of. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, it was very much a close up, like side profile, and even just that side profile was. It, it worked. It it helped propel the story and the song, even though I didn't care about him. There were times where I thought it really worked. Anne Hathaway, <laughs> in particular, mm-hmm. and I think early Jean Valjean, like after he's been. Uh, oh my been, god! Yeah, I, I, whenever he has his like his his uh, his crisis after being forgiven by the priest for the yeah. stealing, the, that the thing where he's walking back and forth yeah. in the church. Yeah, yeah. I, or, I think I think they could have pulled back from him a little bit during that at, from mm-hmm. time to time. Maybe like done some high angle stuff to show like how insignificant he's feeling. But I see a lot of the close up work in that is excellent. He was acting his heart out. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like that's the thing. Like you're getting all of that raw emotion, and you see, like you can see and feel so much of the conflict on him. Mm-hmm. Like we've both acted on stage. Yeah. Um. I don't know how much you've worked for on film, but when you we we been um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be French. Uh, <laughs> on stage, you have the benefit of building to the emotion. Yeah. Uh, on film, most times you don't. Yeah, like you, you're doing like, all right, cut back to the beginning of that bit or dialogue yeah. or whatever, uh, and do it again. With having these longer takes, you have the ability to build to that emotion, and you can see that in in Jackman's performance in, in that scene specifically. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, he looks like he's in so much physical pain. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was another long continuous shot. Mm-hmm. If I recall, I don't think they ever cut away because I remember at one point being like oh, they've got to like really get around him and then start like going back. Yeah, it was no it was one, one of the like, first... You feel the physicality yeah. of that movement where like they're really mm-hmm. close on him when he's on his knees there and then he gets up and turns around and they follow his movement yeah. precisely. Like they don't lose that framing. Yeah. I I, I think to that what helps that also mm-hmm. is the fact that this movie did something that was sort of different than other musicals before it was that they did all of the singing in the moment live as opposed to being pre-recorded in a studio for the at least the main characters mm-hmm. yeah. stuff and so especially for instances like that you can hear it you can you know it wasn't it wasn't a matter of like well now i have to lip sync to this thing that i sang right 2 months ago in a studio where i didn't you know, I wasn't in the in the in the set in the moment in you know, anything like that, and so for him, that moment super powerful. For some of the other people, no, it did right. not quite. Uh, maybe some studio work would have been necessary. Yeah, I think that. I think maybe that's the one thing that doesn't work about the production was the dedication to which they, like Tom Hooper, insisted they stick to that on like that on right. site on set mm-hmm. um, vocalization because. Mm-hmm. With Russell Crowe in particular, it just does not work like ninety percent of the time. There are yeah. moments in his in his solo whenever he's singing low, the lower mm-hmm. stuff, that and lower the stuff, stuff. A, yeah, the lower yeah. slower stuff actually does work for him. But as soon as he tries to project, it's just ruined. <laughs> and, and when it, and, 
<laughs> and anytime he's singing with anyone else, when he's in a song with other mm-hmm. people, just like no. his notes are flat, his voice stands out so much in a worse like in the yeah. worst way. He's like a sore thumb. And to be honest, I think his performance falls a little flat in those moments too. Because it I can. think that yeah. he's never done anything like this before. He's gotta yep. feel a little out of his element. You know, hundred percent. I'm sure he yeah. trained with someone to do something, but like Oh, I don't doubt that for a second. But that's another thing with like with Les Mis is like especially the Act One finale where it's like seven different vocal lines all at the same time interweaving and it's beautiful. Like for him to Until pe- you get to stuff like this. Yeah, and he's just by himself in a room with all these yeah. people looking at him. Like you lose <laughs> that but to be in a room with everyone else mm-hmm. is you know, it, you it can it feed helps. all that energy. You can, you, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I haven't ever done the reverse of this where I am acting on camera to a vocal that I recorded previously but I've done a reverse of that where you do like ADR where you've already yeah. done the performance and then you go in and like maybe there was like a fucking plane overhead yeah, uh, and you have to redo the dialogue <laughs> yeah. and it is incredibly difficult to get back to that head because it's like months later sometimes yeah. it's like a year later and you're like I guess I will kind of feign that emotion yeah. so I, I do like the decision to on, on Tom Hooper's part to record the uh, the music on set the day it's happening. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, f- for somebody like Russell Crowe who needed the some assistance, auto-tune. yes, <laughs> yeah, um, it didn't quite work. Even but... just some minor adjustments would have made a world of difference. Yeah. But just like putting it into some sort of program that could, you know, a little zip, zippy top, <laughs> right? <laughs> just even just like, even just like scotch. Well, 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 <laughs> like exactly. finally a hermit, hermit the frog. Kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, so I, I think uh, speaking to what you're were, you were saying earlier, I think that one of the reasons maybe the main reason why people were giving Anne Hathaway shit for those close-ups, right? The, like the yeah. snottiness, uh, same thing with Hugh Jackman, is the vulnerability can be uncomfortable to watch, especially when you are watching yeah. it in a single take, mm-hmm. uncut, up close. Uh, like when I, I know when I was watching it, I was uncomfortable. But I should I be uncomfortable. I felt like I should have been. You yeah. should be uncomfortable during that song because it's an uncomfortable song. Yeah. Like, this woman's been through fucking hell. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't yeah. feel comfortable during that. Yeah, you don't want to feel good. Be like, oh, what like, a don't, nice... And like, what a oh, lovely... yeah, I just watched this woman <laughs> sell a... her teeth. Like, yeah, sure, I should feel great about not... that. What a lovely what a ditty. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. It, it's it, it's not a pretty scene either. And no. it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. No. And I think that once you enter, once, once you leave that specific timeline, they ease up on the close-ups a little bit. Um, which I think yeah. works. It does yeah. work. I agree. I agree with you there. Now it's interesting to me to br- that people make fun of the snottiness of that because mm-hmm. that is not at all something that I noticed within nope, Hathaway and this. Mm-mm. Jump ahead to 2019 with poor Jennifer Hudson and Grizabella. Oh, yeah. and she's nothing but yeah. snot over that yeah. CGI cat fur. It's yeah. ridiculous. It like, yeah, it's and her it, performance was great too. No, she mm-hmm. was fine. It was just the. She was a cat. Suspension of disbelief was not there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, this, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very much so. I think it also really worked with the Samantha Barks in her song. The one yes. mm-hmm. that with, I mean, and it was barely anything. It was she walked up the thing, the little alleyway, went mm-hmm. and then sort of leaned against the wall and then crumbled. It was I'm a like, little suspicious that it was suddenly raining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, it was pretty. The rain did start. I mean, but. granted, I think literally they were like... <laughs> Because obviously, when you see the show, it's not raining. Right, right, right. <laughs> but uh, there are Cue lines. the water cans, yeah, Jerry. <laughs> there are lines in the song about rain. Um, and so okay. we're like, okay, uh, better okay. put some rain in here. Uh, okay, I can forgive that. Yeah. Then. yeah. I, you know. If they had started it drizzling in the scene prior, mm. I think it would have been fine. That would have been a, been a better transition. Yeah. Aesthetically, it it's very nice. I do yeah. like it. Um, the the rain coming down on Cobble Street roads, uh, mm-hmm. kind of pooling in the middle. Loved it. Visu- visually fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's that's the thing that like almost kills me about this. It's like there is a lot of good to pull out of this movie. Mm-hmm. Not Oscar nomination good, no. mind you, but like. I'm not. There were there were some slow songs where I couldn't give a fuck, and I was just like reading about <laughs> Tom Hooper. It's a bit of a trademark of his to have that kind of close up. Um, they described it as very seventies, which like I didn't, I wouldn't describe it as that personally. No. But I could also, um, there was a lot of Dutch angles that you normally would not see. Mm-hmm. True, which... we did notice a few of those throughout the film. I thought it was a little jarring that one of those popped up in the 
uh, like the, like the like apartment conversation between uh, where where uh, where Jean Valjean reveals himself to Eddie Eddie Redmayne. Yes, uh, <laughs> that felt like that felt like a weird place to put one, but like some it was, worked, some didn't. some worked, some didn't. Yeah, yes. Overall, the cinematography, the lighting, all really worked for me. Some of the color grade didn't quite work. It was a bit um, muddied, muddied, uh, but not enough for me to be like, yeah, fuck that shit. Fair. I'd agree with that. Did anything else work for me? <laughs> um, I don't know that anything else worked for me. Honestly, I think I think I think we've covered it pretty effectively. The the group vocals, because obviously those were not recorded live, and we can go into mm. that with the next section. Um, but especially with the, the end of Act One song, "One Day More," and the finale. Obviously, those had to have been pre-recorded because not everyone, right, would, right, you know, that just, right. the balance would have been like totally off. But that, oh my God. that, that was the, the those songs were vocally nice. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the sets worked. The ones that were there, the actual physical like indoor sets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think there's something to be said for that. And the the computer ones weren't. Super jarring. There was they were a little jarring. There were moments where they were jarring. Sure, I I don't think that they. I don't think any of them were like woof. Right. Yeah. Not like cats. Of, I'm like, I, what the fuck? Is I happening? think a lot of Anne Hathaway's scenes. I think I feel like they might have actually been more or less sets built in, like mm-hmm. her on the stairs and all that stuff. I feel like it happened, you know, like in one day. You know, the, with like they were like, hey, we built this shithole. <laughs> that entire that entire set felt theatrical Mm -hmm, like i don't feel like like some of the other sets especially later during the the rebellion i'm like okay you know i could see like walking down this this alleyway and and encountering this type of thing whereas hers was a little bit more of a heightened reality like the way that like the other sex workers emerged from like that wall of windows and doors and such like yeah it felt very very dramatic the when she like enters the ship into the I don't know her house. I don't know if it was a house. It looked kind of. I don't know if it was metaphorically her, her, her a coffin, little coffin, or it was bed. coffin. Yeah, yeah. Um, felt very uh, much like a stage, but not yeah. in a negative way. Yeah. Um, they didn't have goth as a concept at the time, so just <laughs> they they were building the foundation for goth, <laughs> <laughs> except for the goths yeah. who actually built the. Foundation for golf. Yeah. Uh, There's a hot topic on the spot of this film <laughs> set right now. Uh, f- great. We're all doing the best work of our careers. Um, <laughs> let's let's take a break, run some ads, and drink some more, and come back and fix this shit. Hell yeah. Hey, let's fix this fucking movie, eh? All right. I have, I have two suggestions. Okay. Because I don't think it's, as we've discussed, I don't think it's a terrible film. Mm-hmm. I think it tries to cram in too much. Yeah. I think HBO should buy the rights to the musical, split it into a four-part series. Oh, each. we're going limited series. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think okay. Each episode, an hour ten. Hmm. I can handle that. With credits. With <laughs> <laughs> Because I want to say Angels in America was HBO. Yeah, it but was, but it was, it was a two-parter. It was a two-parter. I, it was a two-parter. Yeah. I think yeah. so. But the the play itself is also in two parts. Yeah. yeah. Angels in America might have been six. It might have been six. I think six. it was six. Yeah. I Because I, I, I've, I've only ever yeah. seen the first part of Angels in America. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> where, like... Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> it does... <laughs> <laughs> Where like the, the the things do change. Spoilers for Angels in America, but like it it ends with uh, an angel like descending. Yeah, um, I've seen the movie adaptation or series adaptation, and then I've seen it live, and I'm like, I have no idea what happens after that. Yeah. Like, okay, so the play is a two parter mm-hmm. uh, between Millennium Approaches and Perestroika. Yes, yes. and you are correct. It, the HBO series was a six parter. Six. Okay, so three and three. Yeah, I feel like it did. That makes sense. I, I do I'm remember like, that would be like, like took real a while yeah. to like cram two plays into it's, two episodes. It's not to you know not to go back to my cousin Vinny, but it's dead on balls accurate. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, nailed Marissa Tomei's <laughs> accent in that moment. Like I, it just sent me back. <laughs> Holy yeah. shit! Yeah, it, oh, it's, it's shit. basically the script. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Which I, I appreciate it. Uh, so I think that HBO um, 
especially if it were made today with HBO Max. Oh, yeah. Um, could do a four to six part series adding in more of Hugo Weaving's uh, book. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Victor, Victor Hugo. Hugo. <laughs> no, fucking Agent Smith didn't write this, all right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to let that one stand. That was, <laughs> But I have to say that as you said, I'm looking at you, I'm like, oh, his book, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, right, I, yes. I bought it. I was there I, with you. Agent L. Ron <laughs> Vel- Van Red Skull, yes, absolutely the, wrote the this book. The look on your face was worth every ounce of my being awake today. <laughs> where, <laughs> where the moment of realization. Where... I'm almost pissed off I'm in profile right now. <laughs> There was like, you're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then you Wait. literally shook your head like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh, Christ. Beautiful. Uh, I'm glad I lived another day. Uh, <laughs> so HBO Max could add more of Victor Hugo's novel. Yeah. Um, I would. Hugo I would even... weaving into the writer's room. Oh. That he was not cast in some manner is upsetting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly. I don't know if he can sing or not, but like. They didn't ask that question with Russell Crowe. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just precisely. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> the bar is pretty low. When I watch an adaptation of something, I want there to be a difference. Yeah. Like, I don't want to watch the same exact thing that I could experience in a different format. Yeah, no, you want it, you want it to work for the medium. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me go off on a tangent. Uh, so we, earlier we were talking about Mark Millar and uh, Grant Morrison. Caleb, sorry, we're probably gonna leave you behind. Behind, uh, I'm, I'm gonna follow it. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much you are into comic books, but oh, great, cool. Um, <laughs> so Mark Millar is a comic book writer who's been very uh, has has done very well in film. Um, yes. he did Kick Ass. He did. Uh, he wrote Kick Ass, the comic book. He did uh kingsman um he did wanted this. yeah a lot a lot of his stuff has been adapted into you know films of varying success right. but overall like none of them have been horribly panned enjoyable well, no. No. so there's grant morrison and there's mark millar and uh, grant morrison used to be the mentor of mark millar and mark millar writes a lot of comic books that have since been adapted into films or series uh, he just writes very adaptable material is it's very action oriented it, it has a little bit of a twist uh to give it some some spice uh whereas grant morrison they write their stuff for the format they're working in so if they're working in comic books they're writing for comic books they have worked in t- television they work in television so when they have a comic book, say that they have a, a kind of their version of Homeward Bound mm-hmm. called We Three, which is phenomenal <laughs> and really sad. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, excellent. One of the best comics I've ever read. It's been in, in development hell forever. And I think part of that is because it's not super adaptable to mm-hmm. film. It's not, it's not easily adapted to film. Yeah. Right. And I wonder if, the story by Hugo Weaving is Victor Hugo. Victor Victor Hugo. Hugo for Weaving. God's sake, Victor Hugo. <laughs> if Agent Smith probably didn't write this in order to be adapted to the screen, I think that ex- extending the script to a longer, uh, uh, making it longer so that it fits in more of the material, more of the character development. That is in the novel, presumably, I, again, I have not want, read the novel because I've been trapped in a cabin in the middle of the woods and forced to either choose between that or double ply toilet paper. Uh, <laughs> and listen, sometimes toilet paper is just fascinating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. So so I, th- I think Layman is, uh, is a little hard to adapt yeah. because <laughs> it is it is for a certain format. But if you extended the runtime, yes. that would help to develop yes. the characters, make, make yeah. you give a shit because like – um, make me care, the, especially the love triangle in the second half of the film. I'm mm-hmm. like, I, I don't care. I don't care. You, you guys Not like no. thought each other were super fucking hot yeah. from across. I the room. Think, yeah, I think that's important only because we talked earlier about them moving her song to mm-hmm. before 
like before like where the act break would be, right? Right. If it had right. been an act two where it is in the show, it gives a little bit more context to that love triangle, even though you don't really see Amanda Seyfried in after that big group song at Not all. Really? I don't no. actually remember where. Yeah. Uh, other than the other, the, yeah, yeah the, it's the group song, and then it's the war. Yeah, quote war. Uh, and so you don't and, see her after that. Yeah, like Act Two basically mm-hmm. starts with them launching the offensive. Yeah, at, at the, the funeral, at the funeral. Of that guy. Yeah, yeah. Lamarck. Like she, Lamarck. her character, even though she's not on screen a lot in the first uh, half, is still important to the plot. Mm-hmm. Um, she's talked about a lot, especially through um, Anne Hathaway's character. I think another thing that would help is recasting a certain characters. Actor. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that maybe Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell Crowe. Kurt Cameron. Kurt Russell Crowe. Uh, Kurt Cameron. <laughs> You're right. Kurt Cameron shouldn't have been in this movie. <laughs> Cameron Crowe was yeah. probably not oh, the God. best <laughs> person to cast in this. Yeah. I'm sorry, Joe. Kevin Bacon. Kevin. <laughs> you shut the fuck up. You know what? <laughs> uh, so he we're gonna fought worms. He could fight the French. <laughs> I've lost count of the number of Tremors references we've had over the past several episodes, but God damn it, I'm thrilled it happened yeah, again. I'm not upset about it. No. Uh, so I, I left it up to you to choose who yeah, replaces no, that is, There's a lot of pressure. I was really torn between... I had four. I've narrowed four. it down to two, and I'm pretty Ooh. sure I'm settled on one. Oh, damn. Okay, I want to I'm going to give process. you my, my non... The one I didn't choose. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was John C. Riley. Oh. Oh. He can okay. sing. He can. We he just got to hit those notes, in Chicago, right? Chicago, and he also sings really high in uh, Prairie Home Companion. You can't really tell because of the style of the music. Oh, but his notes uh. with Woody Harrelson are like much higher. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we can definitely sing. I think he can play age really well. Yeah, that's that's accurate. And I've I I think he could really do the. Uh, I, I think there is a, a little bit of nuance with Javert that is a little bit uh, playful, and that he sees, in the, especially in the first half, where he sees like Jean Valjean as this little like plaything that he can mm. just sort of like kind of cat kind of like yeah, thing. kind of fuck yeah. with, and they'll be like, you know, <laughs> well, run away, I'll I'll catch you anyway. Like, yeah. please go, like go ahead. Um, I think he could do that really well too. But I didn't choose him. <laughs> you didn't. Well, I did. Which is curious now because that's a really good like push for him. I, yeah. I do I think he? If Hugh Jackman weren't the person he was playing against, he would be excellent. But Hugh Jackman yeah. is a little too. I really quick. I do want to know what the, yeah. the other two were that weren't. That oh, that didn't make mm-hmm. the list. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, your three and four. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh man, I scratched him out. <laughs> oh no. Uh oh, Steven Weber was one. And I think I was just I, right? I happened to be scrolling through my phone. Steven Weber, uh, he was on Wings. Uh he's oh, in wow. Reefer Madness as the bad guy in Reefer Is he Madness. Like a oh, shit ton like Stephen King. Adams? Yeah, he's he was in the the T V adaptation of The Shining. He was Ooh. Uh, Oh yeah. That is a is, that is a deep cut. Yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> was a deep cut. That was my Celine Dion impersonation. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, he's a good actor. He's, uh, he is really good, and he can sing. Okay. He's been in musicals. I, I think he can do anger well. And I was like, "That's all you've got going for you." And then mm-hmm. um, Patrick Wilson from Oh Ooh. yeah, oh I, I do. Love Who we can also sing. He's been mm-hmm. on, he's been on a couple Broadway shows. I think I did not know that. Yeah, okay. he can sing. And, and pa- Patrick Wilson from Angels in America, Angels correct? in America, uh, the Insidious movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that yeah. that was why that was one of the reasons I was like that. Those Insidious movies where he's like the mm-hmm. possessed person. Like he's terrifying. He haunts my dreams to this day. He very he very much can be. Yeah, yeah. he's got that intimidation factor. That I think could work really well. But I ultimately chose, and I now that I'm thinking about it, I might have switched back to John C. Riley. <laughs> but, but in the time that the movie came out, which I believe is the rule, right? Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> you're going to laugh at first? Maybe. I don't know. John Lithgow. Interesting. John Lithgow. I who actually... can also sing. He was in the musical version of Dirty Rotten Scoundrels as okay. the Michael Caine character. Oh. Sings amazingly well. Like, huh. to the you would not expect it. No, not and, at all. And, like, if you have a chance, like, yeah, YouTube, just one of the songs that he's in in that show, just to hear him sing a little bit. 
preferably I think the song is called Dirty Rotten Number and he has the first part and it's really it's brilliant like he's so good and I've only ever really known him from Third Rock from the Sun uh, that's my <laughs> my bread and right, butter right. like sure. that's what I know him from and then I've never seen him on Dexter but I've heard great things I heard he's terrifying um, I believe that and he, then he is. He is seeing him in the in crown it. as what's his face doesn't matter. Uh, Arthur, Winston Churchill? The fourth. Yeah, somebody, somebody something. I don't know. <laughs> Who the fuck knows? Voldemort. Voldemort. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and his uh, sort of dark side, because uh, he also is um, the guy from Fox News that... <laughs> Which one? Uh, in the move, the bombshell movie. Sorry, he's not oh, actually sure, a guy sure, from sure. Fox News, but the, the bombshell movie where he played uh, the head of Fox News. Roger Ailes? Yes, yes. Oh, he fuck. plays him, and it's 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 cringeworthy oh, it has to be. but John yeah. Lithgow is, is a dark phenomenal actor that doesn't get the credit that he deserves yeah. and I think at 2012 I think he could have pulled this off I th- absolutely I he's think who I chose as my number one he is an interesting I think he's a really good choice I think it would be a little bit of a hard sell to a studio just because he's not known for playing I feel like people know him more from like third rock from the sun yeah. where he's yeah stick comedy um, and he can do that too <laughs> But he is a, a very flexible actor who has a, a very wide range. Mm-hmm. And I I would love to see him go up against Hugh Jackman. Yeah. I think that would be entertaining as hell. Yeah. Um, John Lithgow, Harry and the Henderson. Get no. out of here. <laughs> yes. Can't you see we don't want you anymore? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's 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 my that's my now I'm kind of upset that it, it didn't happen because I think he would be <laughs> amazing. Like I, I understand yeah. why the role. The role to but... sing, it's honestly that role is not hard to sing either. It's nope. not super high. It's a baritone role. Most people that can sing can sing his songs and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody you... thought it was a good idea. <laughs> you were saying when we were watching the film that that role is highly sought after. Yes. Why? In the show, I I think, and, and and being that you've only ever seen him play that role, correct? In the show, that's the role that I think most people most identify with. I think it's the most fleshed out role when you see the show. It's really weird to hear having watched the movie because I thought it was so two dimensional. Two dimensional. Yeah. You, know. you get more, and maybe it's because I've seen good people play him. Mm-hmm. I've also seen bad people play him. Not including Russell Crowe. Sure. Uh, but there's a level of depth that comes with him, especially when it comes to the obsession sure. factor. And that's something that they didn't play on in the movie. I don't think at all. You didn't get obsession in any way, shape, or form. And I think that is key. I think that's crucial to him, spoiler alert, committing suicide. Because it's this obsession, obsession, obsession. He's going to get this guy. He's going to get this guy. But I think I think there is this level of, of Javert that's like he, uh, yes, he's an officer of the law. This guy stole a loaf of bread. <laughs> like Literally. it's not a it's not a crime. I mean, it is a crime, but like like, right. like it's 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 yeah. by the strict letter of the law, it's a yeah. crime. I've but stolen like, before. I didn't wind up in the same boat. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like like you see somebody yeah. stealing a loaf of bread. No, you didn't. Just like, right, right. Like, leave it to the fuck alone. Right, but the hierarchy of how the law is at that point is that yes, he is a criminal, and mm-hmm. Javert's job is to treat him as such. One of the things I wanted to suggest for this fix was to make it known that Javert's chasing of uh, Jean Pajan is a personal thing. Yeah, yes. because in my head, I'm like, yes. do you do you chase down every single? person that steals a loaf of bread because that's a lot you are a busy fella mm-hmm. yeah you mentioned that while we were watching it it's mm-hmm. just like, like like is this a thing that you just normally yeah. do like you figure out that like somebody that you let on parole has gone off and done mm-hmm. some other th- something completely unrelated mm-hmm. in this case started a business i guess and right. you still Maybe, like yeah you still like you, know, like you found out yes. that that's who that was and you decided to chase him yeah. down yes like you, how many murders do you miss yeah. How many, how many like carriage how many steps have you not solved? He could have gotten like, Jack the Ripper because maybe it's in Britain. We don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> but he was too busy chasing down Hugh Jack. Listen, Britain. French Englishman. <laughs> yeah. 
like it's decades of obsession and we don't we don't yeah. we don't see that in the movie you do get a little bit more of that in the show and so when it comes up to the suicide song <laughs> it just doesn't sound feel good to say no. that but, swan song. but that's we'll what it is swan. Yeah, swan, swan song. Yeah. song yeah the little divey song yeah, in the, the way movie swans kill themselves. yeah in the movie that it his suicide Sorry. comes out of nowhere <laughs> You know, yeah. In the show, it makes sense, okay, because you get okay. a little bit more of that, and that's be and, like, yeah. To be honest, the role of Jean Valjean, yeah, coveted, but it's hard to say. I mean, he's got a hit. Yeah, he's got a lot of yeah. notes, and he's pretty much in the show. He really is much more involved than I think Hugh Jackman is in the movie. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. they've got the people doing their own like little songs, and once the war starts, not so much. But like, he's 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 the lead. I believe he's the final bow. Every, I time, I, every time, every time I've seen it, I'm pretty sure he's the final. Battle. Considering he's kind of the through line yeah, through a right. lot of these situations, I'm not surprised. Right, Javert, yeah, Javert. no, Jean Valjean. The, oh, right. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I think what I'd like to see out of Javert, Javert, J- Javert, 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 uh, is he and Jean Valjean having a conflict of ideals. Yeah, so that when it ends he his worldview is so shattered that he is unable to change and therefore right. completes suicide right. and we talked about this too a little bit while we were watching it was that the point of a musical whenever a song comes on yes. we're taught in 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 theater school <laughs> uh that the reason that you sing is that because the emotional state stakes are so high that you've got nothing left to do but sing so in a show that is completely sung through, with the exception of a few added lines, <laughs> much random like Journeys to Mordor, Rent, Rent, yeah, which yeah. well, yeah, the movie where the Rent where they like took sung lines and made them into real lines, and it just is cringe worthy, especially when they're singing about AIDS and ACT. I hate the Rent movie. I've, also. I've only ever watched Not as the much show. As I've never is. seen the movie, but don't you, you don't just take an ACT break. Yeah, yeah. Like I was drunk on Mad Dog ACT when I saw the movie, so I don't remember. Any of it. I would, I would rather have that be my memory of it as well. Uh, but yeah, the the so the a show that's completely sung through, right? The 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 emotional stakes would have to be so high the whole time mm-hmm. that you have to believe it, and you don't get that with Les Mis as, as a movie. As a show, you look at it as an operetta where it's sung through and like you know that you know it going into it. But yes. as a movie, I don't think people are going into a movie to see an operetta. They're going in to see a movie. I don't think most people yeah. know what an operetta is. Exactly. What is music? <laughs> what is it? Uh, it is glam rock. Very, 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 <laughs> very, very, very quick sidebar. Yes. I took a, a certain uh, student of, of our friendships. Mm-hmm. Uh, on a date, mm-hmm. uh, it was the very first date I had in college. We went to get coffee at Commonplace, Ooh. and then we're like, "Oh, we're going to see this operetta," which was I can't remember what it was, but it was is it was an operetta, so it was awful because it, it's just the same song being repeated over and over and over and over right? and over and over again. And I had like the worst fucking gas, just like building up <laughs> in my soul, uh, and I'm just like uncomfortably like leaning from one cheek to the other, and I'm like, "This is the worst." Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I don't think it's quite as repetitive as an operetta, but I, I think the style of music is is that. Yeah. Moving on to our next recasting, yes, uh, Eddie Redrum. Redrum. Um, <laughs> we had talked about a little bit during the movie, yeah, about not entirely recasting because he wasn't awful, right? He wasn't, and this is a thing that we've done in several movies up to this point. <laughs> yeah, I think the best solution here is just to shift some roles around. Yes. Yeah. I think that the and I'm I keep forgetting his name, but the actor who played um, the the a little bit more um, Aaron Tivet, Aaron Tivet, which a- who's Aaron, I don't know what his real character name is in the in the in the in Les Mis. You said Aaron Tivet, Tivet, Tivet. Yes. Okay, yes. I, I think, think I could that could be wrong. Sure, too, but um, that's how I say it. He has amazing hair. Yes, yes. Uh, him and him anime perfectly quaffed. Right. Like, <laughs> there's there's a war coming on. You've been stuck in the field for days, and you were stalked on pomade. Yeah, <laughs> yes. the pomade. <laughs> Moving him to one. Not only is he a better uh, singer, mm-hmm. but he also has more energy. He has more want mm-hmm. uh, for this revolution. Moving him into the Eddie Redmayne character. Yeah. Uh, moving Eddie Redmayne into the 
some other character someone, someone else yeah yeah so there's another like i think the way we had framed it before was that like the three like kind of top ranking revolutionaries mm-hmm. that we see are eddie redmayne uh aaron tivet and the guy that kind of looks like he'd be a substitute for <laughs> for uh for frodo, frodo in yeah. uh in lord of the rings yeah so if you you move aaron tivet up into the in, into eddie redmayne's role Main you role. move the hobbit up into aaron tivet's role and you move eddie redmayne to the hobbit's role and yeah. I think that solves it because then you still have Eddie Redmayne getting a lot of featured moments mm-hmm. and arguably some of the most emotional points because that character's the one character that gives a shit about the kid being shot. Yeah, right. no, one else can, right. no one else yeah, cares. No one else tries dies. to stop him. He's the one guy who's like, no. Uh, d- d- yeah. D- d- I forget the kid's name. but Not only that, it's uh, Scotty. Uh, <laughs> not only do you Charles. have him giving a shit about the kid dying. You don't have him giving as much of a shit about the revolution so that when he goes back on giving a fuck about the revolution and goes on you know, just to marry mm-hmm. Snow White, yep. it's a little bit more believable. Whereas in this, you like, oh, you were literally the dude on top of a wagon with a gun pointed at the French army, and now you don't give a single fuck. Why? That's a big shift. Oh, so you're suggesting that not not only do we switch the character – in terms of that casting, but we change the storyline oh, so it's still Eddie Redmayne who carries through to the marriage and everything in the end. Correct. Oh, okay, because in my brain, when we initially talked about that, I was thinking Aaron Tivet would be the would be the character that went through in that in that line. And initially, I was thinking that as well, but I think because it it's so hard for me to imagine somebody having such a prominent role in the revolution going back on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Like you still present Eddie Redmayne as a main character because like there's no way that I don't I don't I think was it Paramount or Universal I think it was Universal who made this I don't think Universal's ever going to be like no Eddie Redmayne's going to play the third name revolutionary like that's not going to happen but if you have him still like as love interest who then goes on to the marriage sure. But then you have him also like the third removed from giving a fuck about the revolution. Sure. Right. I buy yeah. that. Yeah. I buy that. I think that's. I think that's an excellent move. I think that narratively makes so much more sense. It makes that much more believable. And there was a final fix that initially I thought would work before we expanded this to like a four to six part series on HBO. Okay. And that's the love triangle, mm. right? <laughs> In the real world, what would have fixed this lickety split? Maybe not lickety split, but you know, with some some deep thinking, some some processing, some intentionality, some intentionality, uh, some very clear and open communication. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in in the film, you have Amanda Seyfried, uh, Eddie Redmayne, and I can't remember her name, Sam Samantha Barks, Samantha Barks. Barks. Yeah, um, in a love triangle. Yes, and. Uh, it doesn't in, in the movie at least you don't see as much r- romantic intention from Eddie Redmayne to Samantha Barker, but I feel like it's there. It's just not explored in the it, film. It's yeah, it's supposed to be there. It's kind of implied mm-hmm. that like they've been playing house, perhaps yes. like leading yes. like like uh, we get leading that up to the little revolution. scene of her like in the doorway like being coy. Yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. we've all yeah. done it. That's what I was just thinking. <laughs> yeah, but outside of that, we get no other. Well, like Amanda Seyfried has those breasts that can tell the weather. Yeah, seventy percent of the time. <laughs> yeah, there's a sixty percent chance that it's already raining. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, I present to you the solution of polyamory. Let them all fuck. Yeah, <laughs> there's two solutions that fuck over every dramatic film: polyamory. Yep. Cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we eliminate one, when when you have only one two... option is possible. <laughs> if you are in a horror film and you have a cell phone, that fixes like seventy percent of your issues. For the, yeah, if yeah. you know how to use it, if you know how to use yeah. it, like they have to go out of their way to knock out phone service right. somehow yeah. for a, right. for a yeah. lot of right. things to work. Right. If you're in a romance or rom com, if you introduce polyamory, that fixes like seventy percent. Seriously, of your issues. yeah. So <laughs> nineteen eighty. Let's hook them all up. Or eighteen sixteen 18, France. Yeah. It's eighteen thirty two at this point. So got it. Yeah. 
they stumble into polyamory. It's really a little frowned upon, upon at this point. <laughs> it's a little frowned upon. <laughs> it might not be the most socially uh, acceptable thing. It might not actually be a thing at this point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's the thing. It might not have a name at this point. So who's going to give a, a fuck? Name. It's right. right. Yeah. They're just like, oh, that weird couple lives down the street. <laughs> yeah, right. We're going to uh, support all the prostitutes in the beginning of the film just right. doing what they got to do. But if these three people try to just bang it out, <laughs> we're going to have a problem. A thruple? In England, France? No. Uh, so that is my solution. Uh, our solution. Yeah. I, I, I support that. I endorse this. I think, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that is absolutely the move to like simplify that plot mm-hmm. to, I mean, it, given you're changing a lot of what's going to happen regarding Samantha Bark's character, like mm-hmm. uh, Eponine is not going to have the kind of lovelorn for uh, uh, unrequited aspects of her character going on. But I think especially yeah. if you build this into a four to six part series, then you're giving more screen time to them fleshing out this relationship and the struggles yeah. that are inherent within a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. You could still get the emotional punch out of her death and out of Absolutely, and out of those yes. moments uh, even if it's especially just especially if she's not just connected to Eddie Redmayne but if she's romantically involved with both Eddie Redmayne and, and her yeah. oh. having her be present for maybe even her death in some way shape or form yeah. where it's like she she's there but she can't quite be there oh, right 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 like that sort of like lustful remorse yeah that's tragic yeah, yeah. oh my heart that'd be beautiful it could you're be. supposed to care yeah. when she dies in general yeah but give that another dimension mm-hmm. that's you know tearjerker absolutely yeah. not a dry eye in the house not Jules and Jim but or seat limit or... <laughs> <laughs> oh. everyone's just weeping and wet <laughs> They're so horny. <laughs> Why can't they all just work it out? <laughs> uh, well, I don't just see horny a and harrowed. single other way to fix this film. In fact, I think we fixed it so hard that it's perfect. perfect. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to recap, you are expanding this out into a four to six part miniseries on HBO. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are recasting... Russell Crowe to become John Lithgow, yes. where re- and we are shuffling some of the casting so that Eddie Redmayne plays a different role. That mm-hmm. his his storyline still follows through, but he is not like the face of the revolution because yeah. that doesn't make any sense to begin with, considering the richness of his character. And we're and we're eliminating the rov- the love triangle by turning it into a polyamorous relationship mm-hmm. with real emotional stakes and Which actual makes, heartfelt connection. Makes yeah. the wedding kind of tragic. It makes the yeah. wedding kind of tragic too. It because no one's happy. Nope. No, well, you would even say no that they one... might be miserable. Uh, thanks for joining us for another episode of <laughs> Drazzled. Uh, this will be the first and last time we ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh, um, myself. <laughs> well we love you Nor- so- normally we uh we say like okay now that we fixed the movie what are the uh gradings but it already has like a really high yeah that's score. the thing i don't i, I mean yeah. i don't know if we would change the ratings on this no. i think it would go either way depending on how critics would respond to it mm-hmm. um Especially with the polyamory angle, I think yeah. that, that like there, I think there are some people who would take issue with that, uh, and might rank it lower because of that, or it might open some eyes and be like, "Oh shit, yeah, this is a thing that could work," and they really play it to an emo- to their emotional advantage. Like, especially if you don't actually use the word. Yeah, if you never actually utter right. the word polyamory, it's assumed. The, right. I think the moment you utter the word, especially in a in a period piece like this, you yeah. be, it becomes ham fisted. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, you're pushing an agenda. You're pushing an agenda, right? Yeah, if you just let it be and you let it de- you let it develop and flourish the way that yeah. it needs to, I think I th- I, th- I think you you yeah. force some people. I think yeah, I think that the 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 audience base that rated it so high might not be as strong, but I think that in the fixes that we made, you expand the 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 fan base, general audience much I, more I, because I, you give it more story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know that you necessarily like make up for those losses, but I think you maybe even convert some people who rated it poorly because they hate love triangles mm-hmm. to like to think about it differently and give it a different give it a, a, a different look. I yeah. agree. Yeah. So instead of adjusting the critic and like IMDb wrote and tomato score. We give it the Oscar. We give it the Oscar. <laughs> 
we I would like to hear your justice score because you yes. rated this movie very low. I, just, I think yes. I, I, I think I gave it thirty five percent. Something like uh, that. Yeah. Before we even get a twenty five, yeah. if I'm yeah. not mistaken. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so, right. what would second. your Rotten Tomatoes score be for this? Rotten movie? Tomatoes. If we made the changes that mm-hmm. we had, and this is now a, a series, right? Correct. Yes. I'm rating the series. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I would bump it up to a seventy five percent. I was Ooh, thinking seventy three. That's a big yeah. jump. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about IMDb? What, that out was the out of ten. Correct. Eight out of ten. Ooh. Yeah. There are certain structure things that we cannot <laughs> change, unfortunately. You know, we've got the story that we've got, but uh, yeah, I, I I think it all comes down to having the time to care about the people that you're seeing. And yes. if you don't have that, or if you try to smush too much into it, what's the point? I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, my M- I MDB would be like 7.4. I that's think that's good. about where I'd be. Yeah. yeah. What would your Rotten Tomatoes be, Joe? Rotten Tomatoes, I think I'd be, I'd be like, I'd be around a 70, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know me. I'm tempted to go 69, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, <laughs> nice. Uh, no, I think, I think at least a 70. Okay. I was saying like 73. Yeah. I have, I have faith. Yeah. Um, I I have less faith in the critics and and whatnot to to sure. rise to that occasion. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, I think seventies. I think seventies realistic. Yeah, fantastic, Caleb. Thank you for for joining us. Delicious <laughs> drinks. Yes. Yes. Uh, effective drinks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, only just now starting to sober up a little bit. Oh, um, a, li- a little bit. That must be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear audience, if you've not listened to Making a Martini, you are, are missing out. Uh, there are so many wonderful, fantastic, hilarious episodes to pick from. Just just pick one that like you are interested in and j- yeah. just dive right in. Yeah, you've got like a year and a half's worth of content. Yeah, there's there, a which is beautiful <laughs> bunch of episodes. Uh, if nothing else, watch the one on... What did you call the one with, with the, the porn stars? Uh, the Art of Making Porn. Yes. It nice. is so educational and funny. And it's interesting. Interesting. And <laughs> interesting and different. Watch it with your mom and your grandma. Uh, your you honestly could with the exception leader. of a few moments. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down with your professor. <laughs> Let them know that they fuck up. This is what you're doing with your life. Uh, <laughs> Joe. Uh, where can people find Drazzled? Well, you're listening to it right now, but you know that you can find us on pretty much everywhere you find podcasts. Uh, listen to us on uh, Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Good Pods, Podchaser, po- uh, Podcast Addict, wherever you can find podcasts. Please rate and review us on all on any and all of those platforms. Uh, that helps keep, get us further up into rankings and f- algorithm results so that people can find us a lot easier please share the show share our our, uh, our uh, posts on social media so people are more aware of us you can find us on twitter at derazzled pod on facebook at derazzled podcast and instagram at derazzled underscore podcast you can also email us at derazzled podcast at gmail.com to let us know what you think of our fixes uh <laughs> Also, or to let us know what you want us to cover in season two, which is rapidly yeah. approaching. We are nearing the end of season one. Uh, t- uh, you may not, you may have noticed already by the time this comes out, but we are going to be weekly through the month of March, uh, according to our schedule. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a lot that we're covering. It's kind of nuts, uh, but that will all culminate in the 42nd a- uh, annual Razzie Awards and then our season finale, which is whatever wins. So fantastic. And uh, Caleb, I assume we can find yours at all of the same words that Joe said in a word. Yeah. Lay, w- yeah. We're everywhere. Way. I'm pretty sure we're it's me, <laughs> but I'm everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, where, where can people find you on, uh, uh, find you and your show on social media? Yes. So you can find me, uh, on Facebook and Instagram at making a martini on Twitter. I still don't know what the handle is. <laughs> oh, uh, on Twitter at Martini making. I didn't realize that's what I had chosen. <laughs> so it I happens. do apologize. Branding but, is yes, hard with these things. Martini making, and then our host website, Buzzsprout, where all the episodes are there, and then everywhere else you get your podcasts, we're we're there. And Hell yeah, fantastic! Uh, right, hey, so ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentle thems, please tune in next week uh, when we will be back, and we will be sure to razzle dazzle you. Yeah, we will. <laughs> I'm so drunk. <laughs>